on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party Party people, your dreams have now been fulfilled One, two, three, and a place to be it is the BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli. I'm here with the best co-host in the world, Jasmine Lee, on the best podcast in the world, People's Party. Give it up for Jasmine Lee. How you feeling, Jasmine? I'm feeling really, really tricky. <laughs> I saw what you did there. Um, we're going to cease with the puns, and uh, we're going to get into this episode because this guest is very important. We, I want to take my time to make sure that we cover all bases with this guest because this is one of the most legendary guests that we've ever had on the People's Party. And as you notice, we are back in the studio, um, but our guest is not live with us today, but we are on our way back. We are cr crawling and clawing our way out of the pandemic. Today's guest grew up in the legendary storied neighborhood of Hollis, Queens. Well, we have a lot of legends on the show, but this man is a legend amongst legends, a founding member of a band that took over the world, not just the world of hip hop, but took over the world. They merged rock with hip hop. They ushered in a sneaker craze. They were unapologetically proud to be black at a time in the industry when that just wasn't a thing. I think they get slept on for the amount of pro-blackness they have in their music. We gonna get into that. This man is a master wordsmith. I'm not gonna name the band, I'm just starting naming records. King of Rock, Raising Hell, Tougher Than, Tougher Than Leather, Back From Hell, Down With The King, Crown Royal. The first hip hop group to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. The first hip hop group to be on MTV before they had black artists. The first hip hop group to be on American Bandstand. God damn. I got three pages of intro. I'm gonna go to this Busta Rhymes quote. I'm not gonna say all this because it's so much. Busta Rhymes said that this band didn't change music, they changed everything. Mm. And he is 100% right about Run DMC. Without today's guest, who is also a solo artist, a graphic novel author, you know him as DMC, Devastating Mike Control, Daryl Mack, straight from the trap, the king of rock. <laughs> what's up, DMC, ladies and gentlemen? Give it up for Daryl McDaniels. All the people's up, party. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, man. thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be here, man, finally. Oh, man, this thank is... you so much for gracing us. The king is here, y'all. I was so nervous of coming on here, man. Why was you nervous? Because this is so good. Aww. This is like like really good. Like I I hate doing other people's podcasts and I hate doing news, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? When I found you, I was just glued. Wow. Because the the discussions yeah. are very invigorating, important, and educating. Well, thank you, brother. That's um, what I love, it, brother. You know, you and me are from you're a little older than me, but we're from the same part of the world. And sort of, sort of from the same era. So you remember the show, um, This Is Your Life? Yes. Like, yes. I'm inspired this by that. I remember life. Gil Noble, Like It Is, used to be yes. on ABC back in the day. Hell yeah. And he would yep. go in depth. Yes. That's what I try to do for hip hop yep. with this show. That's, yep. You're 100%. Yes, you do. So let me start off by saying, first of all, thank you for impacting every single group from Wu Tang to Outkast to Tribe Called Quest. To, to myself and Yasin Bey for Black Star. I don't know if you know this, but every once in a while, we come out to Together Forever as our opening music. And every once in a while, we will dress in the Adidas suits and get the hats <laughs> and get the Adidas. And we come I out. I saw that one time. You yeah, saw that? Okay. I saw a picture, yeah. yeah. I wanted to make sure you knew that yes. we did that. Um, well, thank you, thank you. You have been responsible for some of my career highlights, including working with Frank Zappa, son, Ahmed Zappa, and Mixmaster yeah. Mike, the legendary Mixmaster Mike. You yes. and I rapped on this. We redid Willie the Pimp to pay yes. tribute to Frank Zappa. Yes. I love doing that. That was amazing, yes. And I another personal that. career highlight was me performing and uh, trading rhymes with you, and I was doing runs rhymes, and you were doing At your Brooklyn own Bowl. with Soul Rebels. That's well, right. Yes, with the That's band. like, for me, it's like, that's like if somebody that played, was an incredible night. I remember beautiful that. night. That's yes. like somebody playing Guitar Hero and then winning the game and then becoming able to play in the band with the person for real, right. like that Mark Wahlberg movie Rockstar. Yeah, that yeah. type of shit. Yeah, 
tell if you know I'm a huge fan of Guitar Hero and DJ Hero, and I'm so happy you finally <laughs> are yeah. shouting out the game. Acknowledge yeah, this. I said yes. that it only works if you if it means at the end of the game you get to really do it in real life. You are doing it in real life. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. I watched the <laughs> South Park episode of Guitar Hero the other day, and they was right. playing. They was like this. Uh, oh, you're with the clicks. Oh, you're with the, the clicks. Right, and he was like, oh, he's right. killing it. That's my favorite right. song. And all you hear was the clicks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reading and supporting my book and posting yes. about my book, Vibrate People High. People really need to read your book. Yes. I waxed poetically about UB Illin and how yes, you did. Yeah. that yes, record you did. felt like, and I just funny, funny, like researching for this interview, I just rewatched uh, Run DMC Live at the Ritz in 1985. Oh, with LL Cool J up front, right? Yes. Yes. Angle. But what was interesting is that these were, I mean, y'all were doing y'all your fast paced, like the rock influence records on that yeah. set. It was like, it's like that. And then it's like yeah. Big Mouth. And then it's like, King you know what I'm saying? It was rock, like, you talk too much. Talk yeah, we did. You talk too much. Yeah. 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 And then it was Rock Box. And it was like, yeah. But it was like the big stadium records. And to me, right. at that time, UB Illin was more like a B-boy record. Like, it was like the more black slang. And I remember- Yeah, yeah it was, yeah. My mother being in the car, being like, you shouldn't be listening to this. Because <laughs> she's an English Illin. professor. You know, Run wrote that um, he was inspired by Prince. Okay. He was inspired by When Doves Cry. If you listen to the music. That makes and, sense. And, 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 yeah. So and that was cool. And when he was inspired by Prince to write the song, and he came into the studio and he was like, "Yo, Jay, I got this record." So they went right into it. You know, mm. he was like, "Yo, Jay, it's inspired by um, you know, Prince's One Dove Cry." So Jay created the track and Run went in on it, and he had Runny Ray rest in peace. Yeah, Runny man. Ray died last year of cancer, rest which in peace affects to a lot Ray, of Ray, us. Ray. But rest rest in peace to Runny Ray. It was the star of Tougher Than Leather movie. Who killed Runny Ray? But Long story short, when we when he finished, like I wasn't thinking I was gonna have my own record on the Raising Hell album. Mm -hmm. So Jay, when Run left, because Run was still, a, he was I think he had three kids by then now. So mm -hmm. his first, so he was always a family man, studio, show, home with wife and kids. So when he left, Jay was like, "Yo, D, so what are you gonna do?" I was like, "Huh?" He said, "Yo, Run got a record, and, and that's why I love Jay. He looked out. If Jay wouldn't have said this, I would Run would have had UB Ellen." And I would have never had hit it run. Right. So Jay was like, what are you going to do? I was like, huh? He said, yo, run got a whole record where he's performing on. You got to have one too. And I was like, yo, Jay, I got these rhymes, man. He was like, yo, what are they? And, um, you know, I started, you know, born to rock around the clock. You can't say I'm the devastator, my controller, DMC. And can't nobody mess around with me. I'm the king of rock, rap, and of rhyme. The three are. Because I was writing. I was like, motherfucker, saying we selling out. Motherfuckers thinking recording and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so my mind was, I was always just pretending, you know, what would Cold Crush and what would Treacherous 3, mm. what would they do at that time? So I said, I got these hard rhymes I want to say. So Jay was like, that's perfect, D. You're going to say these rhymes. And the whole hit it run thing came from, it was just improvision that we was doing on a stage. Jay would go hit it run and run, which run was actually Im imitating Buffy. Oh, from wow. the from the if you blah, blah, blah. right 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 it was, it, that was something Run used to do on the Fresh Fest when wow. we toured with Rest the Fat Boys Buffy too yeah yeah recipe yeah. so long story short Jay was like yo you gonna say those rhymes and you gonna stop D and you are gonna scream hit it run and then Joe's gonna do the Buffy Peapox thing <laughs> so Jay um UV Ellen set me up to have my hit it run record finally make because those would have just been rhymes that was in my pocket wow That's you know dope. what I'm saying. I know you were inspired by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and you even your first rap name was Grandmaster Get High. I was a DJ when I first started. That's mm. yeah. I was a D I didn't know nothing, but but I didn't want to be in front of nobody. Like I never <laughs> wanted to be in show business. But I had heard a tape of Grandmaster Flash doing um good times. Mm. So you know, back yeah. then it was no video, no footage, or nothing. I'm like, how is this dude? Making the good times not only just go good times, boom, boom, but but oh, he was making it go good times, good. Then he made it go good, 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 good. So I was like, I gotta learn to do that. So mm -hmm. me and my brother, we had this little makeshift DJ thing, and I just would go in the basement and practice. I, I learned to do good times, 
I learned to do super sperm. I learned to do I can't stop. Ran, 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 ran. Ran. Like I was dope. Like I was <laughs> Theodore and Flash. Right. That's you know Grand what wizard. I wanted to be. But yes. it, it wasn't. It's funny that you say. Funny that you say that. I, I, I wasn't thinking of ramen. The only thing I liked about when Rappers the Light came out, the only thing I liked about Rappers the Light was the Big Bang Hank rhyme because mm-hmm. it was about Superman. Right. Like now, hip hop had some. Oh, I can relate to that. Right. Like because uh, Mo D talks about this too. In the early years, it, w- it was two types of hip hop out. It was the hip hop older dudes like the Eddie Chibas and the Pete DJ, DJ Jenna Hollywoods. Mm, I'm Hollywood and I'm here to party. I'm right. Disco. There was the disco rapping man. <laughs> <laughs> like these, these guys were, they were 20. They were like 21. Right. So they were like men. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm like 12, 13. I could relate. So when Rappers Delight came out, um, I was a fast learner. So I learned it from start to end. I listened to it like three times. But the only thing that gravitated to me that was, yo, this dude talking about Superman. Because I was a comic book kid. Right. So that was the Rapper's Delight thing. And then that got me in trouble, but it was good trouble. Because if nobody was playing it, if it wasn't on the radio, if it wasn't on somebody's boombox, if it, somebody wasn't putting the speaker in their window to play the music out their window so everybody on the block it there, the older kids used to be like, yo, DMC, come here. I mean, no, I wasn't here. Yo, Daryl, come here. Sing the record, and I would sit there <laughs> and sing rappers. So it kind of made me famous because right. yo, know, the kid from 197th Street knows the record from start to end. The human jukebox, but, yeah, basically. But <laughs> the thing that changed my life to, for me to start rhyming was my brother came home with um, super rapping wow. from the Enjoy label. Yeah. Now, if you remember, the, the, the um, rappers of light was attractive. The label it was light blue with the rainbow. Very bright and attractive. Mm-hmm. He comes home with this. Because remember, Taleb, everything was singles back then. Right. So it said, enjoy. And it said, Grandmaster Flash, the guy who I was trying to be in the Furious Five. And I was like, what the hell is this? My brother put that needle on that record. Now, if you remember, uh, Rappers of Light starts hip hop to hip it to hip it to hip it. Hip hop, you don't stop. Or rock it to the back, you know that thing, which is cool. You know what I'm saying? I just love it. Ain't um, um, empty temp. The ladies pimp, the women fight for oh, my delight because like. I'm the grand. And like, there was something about Banks, Big Bang Cage Ron that was like amazing. And then late, years later, I found it was Cass. It was right. I was about thing. to say, it's like you liked Recipes to Hank too. Which, yeah, you like Cass. That's what it was. Right. Because <laughs> Hank was dope. He was the right. guy I liked in the Chicago. But then my brother puts this needle on. This thing says, It was a party night. Everybody was breaking. The highs were screaming and the bass was shaking. And it won't be long to let everybody know when that flash was on, on the beatbox. Beat box. So I was like, what the? F- what? And then it said, and, and, <laughs> doom, 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 and, and d- then it goes, sha na na. Right. And then this what killed me to live. A voice said, Italian, Caucasian, Japanese, Spanish, Indian, Negro, Vietnamese, MC, just jockeys, y'all, fly kids, full of young ladies. That beat drop, he said, introducing the crew, you got to see to believe. Now, remember, Rappers Delight was three rappers and long-ass record. One long-ass rhyme, mm-hmm. another long-ass rhyme, right. one long-ass another long Just much, this record said... Um, introducing the crew, you got to see to believe five different voices. We're one, two, three, four, five MC. One voice, this one killed me. One voice said, I'm Melly Mel and I rock it so well. And then the second dude says, and I'm Mr. Ness because I rock the best. Yes. The third dude goes, Raheem and all the ladies dream. And then the fourth dude goes, cowboy and I'll make you jump for joy. <laughs> this one killed me. The fifth dude goes, Creole. The other four dudes go, solid go, kid Creole, plant. That's when I re- I told my brother, give me a pen and paper. <laughs> give me a pen and paper. <laughs> I'm running through my basement. Give me a right. pen and paper. Yes. Yeah, and, I, and I just started writing rhymes. And the thing was, I was Grandmaster Get High. And I was also my own MC. I was MC Easy D. Because I'm Daryl. And it <laughs> right. was easy for me to write rhymes. So right. that was the whole thing that brought about my ele- 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 evolution into it. Wow. Love it. That's incredible. Like Flash, you guys followed in their footsteps and you were the second hip hop group to be inducted into inducted the into rock, rock and roll, roll Hall of Fame. Fame. Yes. What was that moment like for you? Truth be told, it, it was so much it was so much controversy for the hip hop going in now. They got it right at least because they put the message in as the 
first. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and they got it right because that just that just represents the whole struggle of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? But I was more ex- and this is just the way I am because Gene Simmons said what he said, and like I'm 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 hardcore rock, classic rock, Dylan, mm-hmm. Creedence Clearwater Are you Kiss Water Army revival? No, my son is okay. Okay. My son is Kiss Army, but I'm okay. everything all the way up to like Pearl Jam, Nirvana, mm-hmm. Rage Against the Machine. Like, that's just me. When I was a little kid, it was Led Zeppelin, Beatles, Stones, Harry Chapin, Janis Joplin, Elton John. They were just, because radio back in the 70s was so different. You yeah. wouldn't hear, you wouldn't hear Stevie Wonder. You would hear, um, you would hear James Brown. You would hear the Jackson 5. You would hear Sly and Family Stone. But you also would hear Harry Chapin. You also hear Jim Croce. You also hear Neil Young and Cro- and it, it was the reason why I loved folk rock so much was I went to Catholic school my whole life. I like I was in the street, so when they sung about presidents and wars and legislation, yeah, and, 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 Kent I, that's State, like social, it's it's yeah, social studies to me. So yeah. I can relate. So when um to answer your question, when when I got inducted, getting inducted wasn't my victory. Because coming from hip hop, oh, it's no music. They shouldn't be in there. Just... Now, I agree with Jim, Gene Simmons because he said hip, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was for bands that played. So I'm a rock guy. So I agree with Jim Simmons. I should have never did that. I got cursed out. Like I don't got a lot of I don't got a lot of followers like running shit like that with my Twitter. And, <laughs> no, Twitter wasn't out. Uh, oh, MySpace and all of that. And yeah, my, my MySpace and Twitter, I got cursed out. Fuck you, D. We could, the punk, like, they hated on me. But then I had to explain myself. But when we got in, here's my victory. Just, th- and this is what I want. Kids, I don't care what it is that you do. I don't care. And not only kids, grown people who have low self-esteem and this and that. My victory was just being considered worthy enough for induction was my victory. Yeah. If I would have never got it. Because they say hip hop is this, it was validation that yes, we're legitimate. You know what I'm yes. saying? But now getting in to be in there with everybody, I stole, sampled, and regurgitated, and re- just to be in there with those so-called rock icon musicians is very humbling. Mm-hmm. But right my on. victory was just I don't gotta be in, but you said I'm worthy for indu- induction. That's enough for me. Word. Love and also, it. fuck Gene Simmons. I'm just <laughs> 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 the, the views uh, by Talib Kweli are not shared by mm-hmm. or endorsed. But, but, but here's Party. what the Rock and Roll Hall, <laughs> here's, here's what the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame said, y'all. So I asked him, "What do you think about all of this and stuff like this?" And um, the head guy, I, I don't think he's the head no more. I forgot his name. When we got inducted, he calls me over and, and he says, um, "We seen what you was writing and stuff like that. You know, you know, you can you have your opinion. Gene has his. We love mm-hmm. Gene because he's very opinionated." He said, "If you play a flute," and I'm mm-hmm. like, "I was like, a flute in a band?" He said, "No. If you just play the flute, woo, 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 and you sell out the garden three nights in a row, that's rock and roll. That's and rock said, and roll. Oh. You know, Word it should have been the music hall of fame, mm-hmm. right?" You right. know what I'm saying? Or, or if it was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for just rock bands, it should have been the Rock and Roll ha- or Annex for soul music, the Rock and Roll Annex for punk. But then you're separating. Now you're yeah. playing the racial, political bullshit game. Everything. Yeah. Look, what, 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 what the world don't understand, because it's always a black and white debate, and what kills the black and white debate is this, and you can talk to the greatest white musicians in rock. You can sit Eric Clapton down, you can sit my boys Steven Tyler and Joe Perry down. You can sit Keith Richards and Mick Jagger down, and they will fucking tell you, dumb motherfuckers is influenced. All that rock shit is influenced by the great black blues artists. That's right. Eric, Eric Clapton will tell your ass the the blues is the roots. Everything else is just the fruits. That's right. So, but they want to divide it and this and that. You know what I'm saying? Fuck it. We all rock and roll. That's right. You know Terrace, saying? it's an attitude. Terrace Martin rolling. is a jazz artist I work with. Mm-hmm. Produced a lot of Kendrick Lamar's uh, "To Pimp a Butterfly," but he Dope. talks about he works with Gla- Robert Glasper and all them. He talks about when he first started working with them, he mm-hmm. was impressed with their ability to do hybrid music or fusion music. He said as he grew up, he stopped calling it that and just started calling it music. Yes, you, um, there's there's a great interview with Ginger Baker, the Ginger legendary Baker. drummer, of great the drummer. Cream. 
That's right. Of praying. And, and then went to Africa mother, and started doing Afrobeat. And I hung out with Fella. Yeah, that's right. He, he got praised and fucked all of you. That's <laughs> right. He was a man. Fuck, it's fucking music, motherfuckers. I'm going to Africa. That's right. He said, stop categorizing fucking music. And he left and went to Africa. No I doubt. Love, I love Jamaica. I guess rock and roll, at the way we're talking about it, it describes an attitude. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude, yes. DMX is a rock and roll star. Yeah, exactly, exactly. M.O.P. make rock and roll music. It's For an sure. attitude. Exactly. The punk rock is so sinful. It's, it's, right. it's an attitude. Yes. Yeah. And if you play the fucking flute Woo! with some attitude, <laughs> you a fucking rock you're star. You a fucking rock star. <laughs> now, um, you mentioned that you were raised Catholic by the McDaniels family. Back when you were writing your autobiography, King of Rock, Respect, Responsibility in My Life with Run DMC, you discovered that you were adopted and that your mother surrendered you to foster care. Um, yeah. And then you did a special, a couple of specials with VH1, right? The first one was, um, uh, I don't know the name my, of the first my one. My Adoption Journey. That's that. That was in 2006, right? My Adoption Journey, right? Yes. Well, I, 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 I searched for my birth mother. That's right. And what I found interesting was that had to be difficult but necessary for you, right? Yes. And thank you for being gracious enough to share your journey with the entire world. But you thanked your birth mother for putting you up for adoption, saying there would be no Run DMC if she right. didn't do that. That's right? crazy. I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Maybe. That's, I mean, that's on a maybe. Yeah. Or from a Hollywood standpoint, maybe. But maybe not. I don't know. I would have never met Run. I would have never went to past schools. I would have never met Jay. Right. I would have never fucking wrote about Adidas. Right. I did pro uh, look, <laughs> I was my mother and father. Just gave me so much. Mm. That 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 was that that. Now the, the crazy thing is, I was involved in a transaction I had no say in. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. what people don't understand yes. about the adoption foster care thing. We're just kids, and there's a lot of emotions. I mean, some happened to me mentally, physically, physically, spiritually. The whole to, 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 to my whole well being. I thought my whole beginning was in Hollis. No, I was born in Harlem Hospital. Mm -hmm. If they didn't decide to take me from Harlem and bring me to Hollis, it, who knows? Yeah. Hip hop would have happened, but it was like my destiny to be part that, of this trio that was going to represent this, I guess, the superhero shit. Yeah. Which is a whole nother story because that's all I cared about when I was little. That was th those were the only people I could relate to, not knowing that my story is like a Superman. Excuse me, Clark. Um, we need to tell you something. You're not really from here and you're not really ours. You oh my goodness. Oh my god. You know goodness. Riggs, you know Riggs Morales, right? Yeah. You know my man Riggs. That's what made Riggs want to hang with me and support me with this comic. He said, You have to do this comic book, B. He said, You want some real superhero shit. He said, most superheroes are adopted. Yeah. Spider-Man, Batman, we all had a parental thing whopped. Yeah, man. Tell me more about that graphic novel and the comic. Uh -huh. Daryl making comics. When I got into hip hop, like I said, when I heard that um Grandmaster, when I heard Big Pink's Grandmaster Cash Rhyme, I could relate to that. You know what I'm saying? I'm this little Catholic school kid growing up in Queens, New York, straight A's, I wear glasses. I'm the kid that got to be in the house when that street light comes on. So, you know, it's traumatic for me. The public school kids is taking my money. I got to run home from school, change out my uniform to put my play clothes on so I could fit in. So I had the best family, but trying to survive and exist in this universe was traumatic for me. So I had to find my world of safety, protection, power, relevance, and all of that. And I found it in the comic books. So when um, hip hop came over the bridge from the Bronx, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, shoot, you could tell stories about who you are. And my favorite comic books was Marvel comic books because Stan Lee was brilliant. Rest in peace to Stan Lee. Yes. I love DC. I love The Flash. I love The Green Lantern. I love Batman, Justice League, but Gotham and Metropolis was fictional. Mm -hmm. Stan Lee really put the superheroes in New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a little kid starting from kindergarten when I couldn't even read all the way up to the eighth grade, every time I opened up a Marvel comic book, I learned about the place that I lived in but couldn't experience it because I couldn't leave the block. 
Mm-hmm. Stanley taught me about Harlem. He taught me about the Lower East Side. He taught me about Hell's Kitchen, from Daredevil to Luke Cage and all of that. So now yeah. this thing called hip hop comes over the bridge, and I'm like, whoa, you could tell stories about who you are because the thing that didn't excite me was until I started hearing the live tapes before recorded rap. In the live tapes before recorded rap, I was hearing, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old, and 18 year olds talk about their sneakers right and going to mcdonald's and the british <laughs> walkers and the pro cat and adidas and i was like oh right. so that gave me validation to talk about now they talked about what they were seeing in the bronx but a lot of those things oh we got adidas here um right. kids in in, in in queens wear um british walkers and alpacos and we go there's 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 a loose joints and i know what hard is hard is and all of that so when i sat down to write my rhymes Stan Lee taught me something because the only time I saw powerful, so-called nerdy, geeky, educated people was in the comic books. Peter Parker, who lived in Queens like me, was awkward. Batman, he had his little problems. All of these superheroes had these little problems that I could relay, a little awkwardness to them. They didn't fit in, but they were these badass superheroes. So Stan Lee, and I talked to this when I speak at schools, taught me, define yourself with an adjective and tell the world who you are, Mr. McDaniels, before you get on that mic. Right. What do you mean? Well, if I say the incredible, you think of Hulk. If I say the amazing, you think of Spider-Man. If I say the invincible, you think of Iron Man. If I think of Mighty, you think of Thor. So now, okay, in order for me to go on this mic, um, I'm no longer easy D. Daryl McDaniels transforms into DMC, the devastating, devastating mic, mic control. controller. Yeah. Thor, my whole son of Byford, brother of Al, banners my mother and runs my pal. It's McDaniels, not McDonald's. These rhymes are Daryl's. Those burgers are Ronald's. I ran down my family tree, my mother, my father, my brother, and me, because I realized, I said, okay, Thor is the son of Odin. That's right. Who lives in Asgard. He got a brother named Loki, and he got a hammer. So I said, I'm Daryl. In my that's in <laughs> Thor's universe. In this universe, I'm Daryl. Wow. I live in Hollis. I got a proper name. So I just started talking wow. about this. So comic books was a big influence. Five years ago, I meet Riggs Morales. I go to Riggs Morales up at Atlantic Records for a music meeting because I had a friend on uh, my manager, Eric, his brother Trees, had an artist he wanted to shop. And Trees was like, yo, D, if I call, I'm they I'm never getting a meeting. But if you call, you might get a meeting next week or, you right. know, whenever. They'll meet with you. So I say, ah, oh, Trace, I don't want to do this bullshit, but I'll do it for you because it's my right. friends. So I call her, hey, um, I'm Darren McDaniels, DMC, run DMC. I want to meet with Riggs. <laughs> it was like, the, the, the secretary was like, who? Right. <laughs> and I'm like, who? Right. This is, this is DMC, run, DMC, run DMC. Okay, hold on. You could come up right now. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Riggs Morales. He's yeah. been, always been a real one. Real one. So long story short, I go up in Riggs' office and I sit there. And Riggs is very, like, he he, he was behind the great rise of Shady and yeah. Eminem's um, empire. He's always with the greatness and the realness and stuff like that. So I sit down in front of his desk and he goes, yo, I'm usually very professional. I never <laughs> fan out. But <laughs> then he used these words. He said, but D, you was like my super, he says this, you was like my superhero with your glasses and your gloves and stuff like that. He said, I'll never get you a chance again. He said, what was it like when he was a kid? And I was like, oh, well, um, all I did was read, collect, and draw comic books. And when I said comic books, he was like, comic books? So to live, we sat there for three hours and we just talked about comic books. Wow. We thought it was just the music that we had in common, but also in our culture, those comic books. So he was like, yo, D, you should do a comic book. And I said, nope. Hell no. You ain't going to get me in trouble. And he's like, yo, what do you mean? I said, yo, us geeks and nerds, we're very serious. Mm -hmm. We're very typical. We don't like motherfuckers taking commercial advantages of our shit. Right. Like, I don't want to. Oh, I said, Riggs, I don't want to be just because I had a couple of hit records. DMC's going in the comic books. I don't want to disrespect Mm -hmm. anything. He said, D, he said, that's very honorable. But he said, yo, D, from what you just told me, you're not doing it as DMC to rap about a car. He said, you're doing it as Daryl, the little kid that loved comic books before hip hop. And I was like, oh, wow. So he said, yo, I'm going to do your flavor. He said, I'm going to take you somewhere. So five years ago, he took me to the um, New York City Comic Con. And when I walked into New York City Comic Con, it was like that scene in Iron Man 2 when he 
fix his hands and the armor comes yeah. on. Everything that had been lost from me, all my comic books, all the TV shows that we grew up on, you know what I'm saying, from the Flintstones to Bugs Bunny, Looney, just all of that was in me. And I was like, wow. And he said, yo, D, you got to do a comic book and you're going to do it as a tribute and a celebration of what makes it great to all generations. So whatever it is that you like, I tell people we are all products of pop culture. You know, as I sit before you, of course, I'm, you know, Grandmaster Flash and Kaz and Cold mm -hmm. Crush, but I'm also, you know, Bugs Bunny. I'm also yeah. the, the, the 1940s um, Boris Karloff, Bella Lugosi, the mm -hmm. black and white Ford, Abbey and Costello. Monster movies and all that. The mo all of that. So he said, D, take all of that and let's create a DMC universe. But then he said, yo, you can't use Marvel. I'm thinking... Not with a hip hop mindset. I'm thinking as a fan of the kid. We're gonna make this comic book and we're gonna take it to Marvel. Rich, <laughs> check me. He said, "Hell no, DMC." He said, "You hip hop. You gonna do? We gonna sell this shit out to Trump? You gonna do this shit yourself?" And he mm -hmm. said, "Yo, if you had to come up with a name for a comic book company, what would you call it?" And he was like, "You can't use Image. You can't use Milestone. You can't use Valiant. You can't use DC. You can't use Marvel." And I sat there for a minute, and I always realized, like I told you earlier. DMC could mean anything to me that's powerful, positive, and productive. And I was like, yo, if I'm making a comic book, I ain't going to have no, you know, cellular, celestial name. I'm going to call my comic book, comic book company D. Daryl M. Makes C. Comics because that's what I'm doing. And no doubt. So now, because I did that, people are going back into the rhymes now, and they see all the Easter eggs was there. Crash wow. through walls. Remember, crash through walls. Come through floors, bust through ceilings, in, knock down doors. Rappers don't do that. Superheroes do that. Word. But I spoke it, and that's what my music started to do. Wow. So now, all, now all the comic book heads, when I go wow. to these comic cons, they go, gee, there was always something about you that I could relate to. You know, son of Byford, son of Odin, crash through walls, devastating, amazing, incredible. I'm like, I, I wasn't like, I wasn't, I wasn't Kaz. I wasn't Mo, but what they told me you could do with yourself. I had to do, I had, you know, Run was very lyrical. I, I can't even pronounce some of the words he could do. So how do <laughs> I come in? When you see DMC, you see a cover, and then you open up my first page. My first page is always the thing that's got to get, like, you'll kill me with 16 bars. Mm. So by my fourth bar, I got to have you hooked to the end of my book mm. where you... You sold. Now you just, I don't care what this motherfucker say. I love wow. it. That's why King of Rock, there is it's none higher. higher. Suck MC to burn Call my kingdom. Science. You must. Watch you you, you can burn down this material shit, but I won't stop rocking until I. You don't determine that motherfucker. So you can say <laughs> I'm old. You can say I'm over. I go do that lyric right now. I won't now. stop rocking until yeah. I retire, motherfucker. So you know that's me on my horse on the first page of the Marvel comic book. When you open it up, you see me on a horse with my mighty microphone and my cape flowing. And you read, <laughs> "I'm the king of rock." You sold now. Now you, what the fuck yeah. is this book about? And then I can introduce you to the mediocre shit. Wow. That's power to me. That's what's power. It is. To me. Start off strong. And you speak about the power of words often and manifesting the power of words, like you right. just said, how you brought that into fruition. I've right. heard you talk about the song, the Jam Master J song, in which you said you prophesied was about to happen with Run DMC. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can you break oh, down those lyrics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we put out It's Like That Sucker MCs, and then we did a remake of a Curtis Blow song called Hard Times. We yep. just did it up-tempo to fit the It's Like That message rap realm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? At that time, everybody was like, Okay, if that's run and that's DMC, who the hell is that in the background? Back right. Then? So me, you know what I'm saying? I studied Kaz, I studied through, I studied Crash Crew, so I understood the dynamic, the representation of DJ and an MC and thing where the DJ's part of the shit. Mm -hmm. He's just not the motherfucker playing the records. Like mm -hmm. he's the most important thing. So I was like, don't worry about it. I got it. I'm the, actually the guy that named J Jam Master, Jam Master J. Wow. Because he wanted to be um he wanted to be Jazzy J or Jazzy okay. J. That's, That's me. A, yes, yes you are. That's true. So he couldn't be that. So yeah. I said, and no, also Jay. shout out to, to to the other Jazzy J as well. 
Oh, Jazz and Jay is amazing. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> the Jazz first Jazz and Jay before you, Jasmine. Oh, okay. DJ Jazzy J J J DJ Red Alert, y'all. So um, I said, Jay, you're gonna be the jam master because when I was thinking about who Jay was, I was like, he can't be Grand Mixer, he can't be another Grand Master, he can't be Grand Wizard. I said his name starts with a J. So the jam is two things. The jam is the record. Yo, that jam the DJ played last night was mm -hmm. incredible, but the jam was also the party. Right. Yo, the jam the DJ played at the jam last. So I said, Jam Master J. I'm thinking comic book shit. He's the master of the whole thing. So <laughs> he'll be the jam master J. And when I told Jay that name, you know, Jay was fly. He was like, yo, that shit ring. It got a ring to it. Jam yeah. Master J. You said the he was walking around saying it, Jam Master J. Right. But What's the whole my jam, name? Yeah. So the whole thing with the Jam Master J thing was um, I had wrote that rhyme before Run put me in a group. Mm. And when I, I said, I got to do a record to tell people J A Y cutting who's that. But now it's my opportunity, and I would have never did this in front of their faces. Furious Five, Kaz and um, Treacherous Three, all of um, Double Trouble. Shy Rock was always nice to me. I love her. Mm -hmm. But all the rapper dudes from the Bronx before me was hating on Run DMC. Mm -hmm. Like, who the fuck is these motherfuckers, soft-ass motherfuckers from Queens right. coming up with all this dick-grabbing attitude on full <laughs> shit? And right. Mel and them knew Run. Mel and them and, and Ness, they all knew Run. We know you son of Curtis Blow, motherfucker. Right. You, ain't, you ain't us. You know what I'm right. saying? You ain't, you ain't rolling with Busy B. You ain't fucking Daryl C and the Crash Crew. So before Run ever taught me in the group, I used to go in my basement and I used to just write rhymes pretending that I was battling Furious Five, Coke Crush Four, and Treacherous Three by myself. And I, I would have all of these rhymes. Like if the, if the infamous battle on Graffiti Rock, I really went off the top of the head and I'm not good at going off the top of the head, but I didn't want to say a rhyme to hurt Modi. If you look at the Graffiti Rock, and Run's funny, he's... He, he's he spit a rhyme that was recorded already. That was, we mm -hmm. was going, you hear it on a record previously. When I saw Modi, I was shook. But going back to the Jam Master J record, on that record, I said, um, where I wanted to put a message, but I hope Kaz don't know. Like, I'm a, I'm a shy guy. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm serious as a fuck that I'm doing it, though. Mm -hmm. But it's supposed to be just in my world, not for y'all in here. Right. But I had to say something in my spirits. I had to say, D, if you was at the Autobahn, or if you was at the fucking Harlem World, or if you was at the Black Door, and fucking the Funky Four, and Kaz and them was in the room with the Fantastic Five over there, and you step up to the mic, and they throw Big Beat on, or rock in the pocket, I'm going to let all of them in the room know, nonchalantly, we're live as can be, never singing the blues. I got to tell y'all all the good news. The good news is that there is a crew, not five, not the first five, not yeah, four, four, not the Cold Crush four, not three, not the just two. Two MCs who are um, changing the game and all other things won't be the same because it's about time for a brand new crew. Who are you running DMC to put you up on the stool? And when mm. I said that, the, the album goes like I said, when live is, is to tell y'all all oh, the good news is that there is a crew. Then I felt bad about saying it because then flashing them wasn't as popular as me. And then I had to get it together. I had to speak to myself and they know D, that's not you, you love them. And when, when you right. see them, you will let them know. But it was just amazing how I I'm really scared of words now, and words had a lot to do with my downfall of me losing my voice or me going in depression because I was listening, saying, and paying attention to the wrong words. Mm. Every time I spoke something creative, happy, and positive, not expecting a result from it, my life was perfect. Wow. But then when I started changing who I was to fit in and all of that, so mm. I just know, um, like, like all scripture says, the power of life and death is on the tongue. So while, wow. you know, when you look at Tupac and you look at Biggie and you look at Easy E, and I, I talk with kids about this, you know what I'm saying? When when you look at Biggie ready to die, I'm not ready to die. My song says, I'm gonna live forever. Yeah. I don't want no guns. I don't want no, I don't want no guns and knobs around me. My right. album cover is gonna be a Volkswagen Beetle with ice cream, puppies, and ducklings. <laughs> and lollipops with my Adidas on, my hat, my Kango Gangster. 
Some gangsters ducklings with some Adidas. Yeah, gangsters a motherfucker. No <laughs> coffins. Funny. You know, I started paying attention to that. But but that whole rhyme, when I spoke that, it just, I wrote that rhyme probably in like 81 and didn't use it. You know, Run found me. D, mm. you wrote these rhymes and putting you in the group. So all I had to do right. was just step to the mic with, 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 with everything that was already in there. Man, God bless Run. Now, Hell back yeah. when he was uh, son of Curtis Blow, before Jay got in the group, y'all didn't have a distinct style yet. Y'all Nothing. wasn't coordinating, as the great uh, John Witherspoon would say. And the story goes, and you can tell me if it's accurate, it was uh, Jam Master Jay's sort of street-savvy style that became the look for the group. Adidas with no laces back then was called felon shoes, as you rapped yep. about. Can you break down the thought that went into that process of changing the look and making it more like what Jay was doing. DJ Hurricane of the Beastie Boys. Oh, shout out shout to DJ Hurricane. Kane. That's yeah. the homie. So the way Jay and Kane was dressing in high school became Red DMC's uniforms. Mm -hmm. Jay and Kane would walk the halls at Andrew Jackson High School with leather blazers, <laughs> leather pants, Adidas suits, and all of that. So the story is when Run put me in the, the group, when me and Run first formed the group, and he put me in his group. We was all over the place. There's probably two or three. There's an infamous, you probably seen it, um, to lay it with the fever shot with the checkered yeah. jackets on. I've seen it. Yeah, so that was one <laughs> look. Then there's, a, there's, there's early promo pics of us where um, I'm wearing Pumas. Yeah, you, I, yeah, I got, you got on London You got clubs. no hat on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. we was all over the place. So when we had a show, one of our first New York shows was at the Fever. So Jay missed it. And DJ Starchild, shout out to the legendary DJ Starchild. Yeah. He had the DJ for us at the Fever. So our second show at the Fever, Jay wasn't going to miss it. So we pull up to Jay's house on 2-3rd and Hollis to get him because we had to leave early to get to sound check. So we beat the horn. Jay comes out on his stoop. Yo, this dude had the four speaker, JVC, two uh -huh. cassette, right? He had the Godfather hat on. He had his little gold chain before Juki Ropes was around. The Fruit of the Loom, you know, the sweatshirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember, he used to wear the sweatshirt. He had the black three-stripe Adidas um, track jacket. He had on the black leaves. And then he had on the white superstars with the black stripe with no laces in them. He had the laces around his neck. <laughs> and when he stepped out on that stoop, before our uh, first producer and man role manager, Larry Smith, the legendary mm. Larry Smith. Larry. Before Larry could say, that's your, me and Ro was like, yo, that's our stage attire. Right. So first it was that, then it was the complete track suit, then it was the leather suits. All because of Jam Master Jay's style and flavor. Mm. Jay had these little side block stores and he would take us to Delancey Street. So imagine me on a train. I'm on an F train with the damn Hollis crew. Motherfuckers got guns right. and weed and 40s. And I'm sitting there, Jay taking us to go see um, the Jewish man who has the leather. <laughs> like it was, a, it was just a beautiful experience. But Jay, he was that dude. He was yeah, the and sound. See, and people the, don't know that rappers back then, largely the successful ones, were dressing like Parliament Funkadelic or the Village People or something. Yeah. And y'all changed that, that up. Yeah, because that was their inspirations. Yeah. See, the first rappers of the first MCs and rappers or whatever are brilliant because they that they, they're great. They had no rappers to look up to because they weren't. Yeah. But when they got into showbiz, and I, I think this is a thing that helped define the, the, the realness of hip hop. The first rappers, when they got into show real records and concerts and stage, the thing is you need stage wardrobe. So their only idols was Parliament, Funkadelic, and Rolling yep. Stones, and Rick James. Right. That's why they dressed like that. They wasn't yeah. out of. They wasn't. Um, they wasn't out of sync with us. Right. They were doing what I'm dressing like Stevie. I'm right. Dressing like the Jackson Five. So for right. us, me running Jay, especially Jay and Hurricane, our shit was when Russell would say, "Y'all need stage attire." We we would go, "Yeah, we do," but we ain't wearing that shit. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> we dress, you know, we we was dressing like the fly kids, the drug dealers, the stick right. up kids, or even uh, on on a more um sincere thing, we was dressing like the break dancers because those were our superheroes. The tracks, the tracks, the tracks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that was our connection to the streets, you know. And by always being fly, we looked like the drug dealers. You know, I had a little gold chain. Jay was the motherfucker that got me the Dookie rope. Right. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even want to wear that. I'm walking around all those years thinking somebody's going to stick me. Thank, <laughs> thank God 
the stick up kids loved Run DMC no so doubt. much. They'll stick everybody in the room for everything, but let me leave with my Cadillac and my Dookie rope because it was something that they honored about. Us, you no know, doubt. I was in that safe space, but uh, you know that's why I, on my rhyme for Adidas, that's why I didn't write like Run Rope. You know the typical thing on DMC. I got more money than you. I had to fight the stereotypical categorization of the black youth at that time because um, there was a there was a prominent man in my neighborhood named Dr. Dees. Mm -hmm. But um, Dr. Dees, he would put out these newsletters, and you know it'd be about diabetes, health, um, drugs. I remember that? So he puts out this newsletter yeah. called "Felon Shoes" and the problems in our community. And basically, he said he was partly right though. He was just trying to say, yo, you see these young boys and girls in front of the grocery stores with all this fly sneakers on, the dudes selling drugs. Those are a problem. But I'm standing there, you know, my friend here, he just got out of Spofford. He just got out of Rikers. Spofford. This motherfucker just did a stick up. He's selling drugs. But, yo, me and my boy Butter, yo, we went to St. John's University. My friend Douglas Hayes, he worked three jobs to get two pair of Adidas. Because my mother wasn't buying me Adidas to live. I was wearing pro cash. I'm keeping it real. I was wearing pro cash. She was like, I'm not paying $35, $40. You ain't getting no Pumas. I didn't get my and first pair. I didn't, yeah, my mother and father didn't buy my first pair of Adidas until I got into graduated and made it to high school. So she said, now you can get your Adidas, but you better not play no ball in them. So when I, when I wrote my rhyme, I wanted to fight what Dr. Dees was saying about all of these. like Yeah, the oh, felon shoes. Yeah, because all yeah. of us, some of these kids was going to college. You was, I love your story. You know what I'm saying? You rhyming and you illing, but you trying to figure out school. Yeah. Nobody noticed. Nobody gave us the benefit of the doubt of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm at the top of my game now. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm on this corner in front of Dolly's with a 40. But my Adidas walked through concert college. doors yeah. and roamed all over. I college stepped on floor. stage. At, at Live Aid. Like, motherfuckers. Like that, right. My thing was... My thing was always to say something to get back at somebody who said something wow. not ended for my, you know what I'm saying? I don't need to argue with you, but I'm going to say something so when you go back and, because recently somebody wrote, DMC was dissing the South. I love the South. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was the South that made run DMC on that level. We lived in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I, we lived in Tennessee. We lived in New Orleans. You know what I'm saying? Scarface and them, all them South. That Daryl Mac, man. Right. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a Southern <laughs> rapper. One guy, one, one guy said, uh, DMC, you know, East Coast rappers, New York rappers always hated. Even Run DMC, when DMC said on Run's house, you need to go down South. You need to shut your mouth. I'm talking to other. It wasn't like go down South because South was weak. I wasn't even thinking about it. I was living in the South. I hung with Jermaine Dupree. Mm -hmm. That motherfucker yeah. danced for Houdini and the made beats. That's woman. right. Like, I'm with the South. I'm Shy D, MC Shy D. Like, I can name promoters and rap groups. I got dudes come out. Hey, I'm a lawyer, but you, you know, me and my rap group in, in Tennessee <laughs> opened up for y'all. Like, don't play <laughs> me about the South. The South, the South, those black people and white people from the South is part of my legacy. That's right. So I had to explain to somebody, see, y'all never, never get it. When I said you need to go down south and shut your mouth, I was talking about go down south and suck my dick if you think uh, I'm whack. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know, girls, right. when you want to go down south, you go. Yeah, um, yeah. See, they didn't catch that. They thought it was dissing itself. I said, no, I'm telling you, if you think I'm whack, <laughs> suck, you need to go down south and shut your mouth. <laughs> mm. It's all about no doubt, just shout. Let's right. return it. You know what I'm saying? So, all that projection. Yeah. It was projecting. So that, that was the motivation behind it. But yeah. Right. Those those words, every word for me had to mean something or Kaz and Mel wouldn't like it. Um, the night that Tupac was shot, uh, Run DMC was supposed to be meeting up with, well, actually, for, before yes. I tell the story, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, mm -hmm. The night Tupac was shot, Run DMC was supposed to meet up with Suge Knight, and yeah. he wanted to sign you guys to bring people together, but you guys yep. never made it into the car because you were waiting on um, Jay to get dressed. Jam Master Jay, yeah, yeah. True story. We would have been in the um, the Beamer with them. The wow. empty back seat was for me running Jay. Shook says he wants us to perform at their club after the Mike Tyson fight. Because Shook had the club, the Death Row Club. That yeah, was it was 661 or something like that? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. The red with the red diamonds and all it, like, mm. you know, the card, whatever. So that was our thing. So, you know, Shook is like, whatever y'all need. He flies us in. He puts it. This one, the Luxor was brand new, too. Mm. Shook put us in suites at the Luxor. So long story short, we did. Shook took a hell of care of us. 
was real cool. And now I don't know if Suge wanted to do it to 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 to, to punch the East Coast in the face. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm a I'm a shit on them. I'm a sign that God. <laughs> I'm a sign my <laughs> DFC. So I think maybe that's his motivation. You know, right? I'm asking Jay and Jay say, you know, Jay's Jay Jay's this that dude. He's like, yeah, nah, bitch. It ain't about that. And even if it is about that, we'll change that shit when we get in it. So I always like that. Shook calls Eric, who's our, still our manager now. Eric with the braids. Everybody know Eric Blair. Mm-hmm. He calls up and says, yo, me and Pac are coming to get y'all. Y'all can ride with us to the fight. Eric says, Shook, you and Pac, yo, we can't go with y'all because this motherfucker Jay's still in front of the mirror. <laughs> Jay was the guy. Don't go shopping with Jay. Rest, he's probably up in heaven doing this right now. If you go anywhere <laughs> with Jay, no, you don't even have to go to the store. Jay always had his piece fly. So you mm-hmm. go in Jay's room, he's spending an hour and a half trying on clothes doing this. Does this look right? <laughs> All right, no, no. What about this? Does this make me look fat? <laughs> <laughs> For a whole hour, so Eric's like, yo, um, we'll meet y'all later. You know, we'll meet y'all at the club, whatever, whatever. So we would have been, and she was coming mm. to get us. Pops excited. I'm having Brent DMC in the back seat. Wow. So, you know, that night, uh, we we go to the club. So we sitting in the club in the dressing room, shrimp, lobster. It was the best time ever. All of a sudden, it was Eric P. Hammer and a whole death row crew. They all just leave. Like the whole club empties. A guy walks in with a briefcase. Comes in the dress room, sets it down on the table. This should be in the movie, too. Opens the briefcase up. It's nothing but cash. Yo, y'all don't got to perform the night Shook Daniel anyway. I'm like, I'm in Vegas. I ain't got to work tonight. Cool. <laughs> right. So long story short, I go back to my room, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. My flight was like 1 o'clock. I get up and I go to the gym. And I'm in the gym that morning. And all I'm seeing is Tupac shot, Tupac shot, Tupac, Tupac. And I'm not believing that at first, but then two and two puts me together. Oh, shit. That's why we didn't do yeah. the show last night. I was there. Wow. We, we could have been in that back seat. Wow. It's crazy. Life takes you so many different places. You're right. That should be in the movie. Mm-hmm. You casually mentioned, when talking about Jam Master J with his fashion, the Lee jeans. You said they had to be Lee jeans. Now, I have a bar on the Blackster album where I say, Whack MCs get their microphone snatched like Lee patches. Right? Yes. And it's because... People used to what, rip the Lee patches off. Because that's how much cultural currency that Lee Patch had in old New York. Yeah. That people who had cheap knockoff jeans wow. would literally run behind you, snatch a Lee Patch, and put and it on their jeans. jeans. And that right. was like the beginning of hip-hop fashion. Hip-hop fashion is so powerful that, yo, if I had white Converse, I would draw, take a magic mark and put three stripes on the side of my Converse to pretend they were Adidas. Yep. That's yep. some powerful shit right there. Yeah, that's man. like, that's powerful. I was never a, well, as they call it, label whore. I'm not, no offense to you guys, but I just right. was, I know, I still don't really know about labels to this day, but I just couldn't imagine me wearing jeans and someone coming snatching off. <laughs> yes, it's crazy. My patch. He used to go down. It's like, yo, he got his patch snatched. Like, yeah, that's, that's funny yeah. though. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Now. How funny. It was traumatizing when we was kids. Oh, so what if you like, oh. what if you snatched somebody's patch and they had snatched somebody else's patch and you got you snatch a fake you snatch a patch that already been snatched. Yeah. Snatched. Oh my god. A pre snatch patch. Snatched patch. A pre snatch patch. Pre snatch patch. Um, huge rest in peace to Jam Master J. Yes. Love to him always. Um, what can you tell us about how instrumental he was to the group? He was the yin and yang. Me and Run, we've done a couple of. Um, 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 festivals and stuff like that. We'll do so, like you know, Chuck. We didn't do it simultaneously. Chuck came to me and said, "D, I want you," and he got me and run on it. But there's no Run DMC without Jay. You know what I'm saying? He he was the thing that made it work. He was the the glue, or he was the he was the screw that without that screw, the reflector or the mirror ain't staying on the handlebars <laughs> of the bike. You know, he was our everything. He was our sound. It was all me and Ren had to do is say, here's what we want to do, and he would make it happen. And he would make us look good while doing it. And yeah. and that's why the DJs make the best producers. Yeah. Because they know DJ, all yeah. music. They make the best producers. Because when you look at Jam Master Jay, the reason why Ren chose Jay was when we was growing up in Hollis, there was the DJs at the block parties that the older men, I'm talking about now, I'm talking about 25 and older, that would just DJ for the block party till about 7.30. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then the young DJs would come out with their equipment on the other end of the block, and that's yeah. when things would get fly. Yeah. So what was good about Jay was Jay could DJ for your aunts and uncles, and mm-hmm. then still quick mix and do all the flash theater stuff. See, mm. in, in Hollis, you had either or. It was, it was either the hip hop, the beat dropping guy, or the party rock, you know. The There's guy like two fifth park days. Yeah, two fifth park, you know, the, the block party. And, yeah. you know, the, 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 the UBA, United Block Association parties. Mm. You know, you always had, you always had, you always had the guy that was like the DJ that you knew was like a flash. But mm. then, you know, every once in a while, there'd be, that's somebody uncle. He doing the music today. Yeah. So he don't know nothing about he's gonna play good times from start to end and blend it in with the next record. Right. He's not gonna start going good. He's not gonna right. put two good times on. Jay was that guy. So Jay Jay was versatile in our existence and presence. Cause another thing about Jay was, you know, which why his death is so sad was he was the guy with the Hollis crew, with the gangsters, with the thugs. But if Jay was there, you lucky because Jay is going to stop his boy from sticking you until you go. And the, the, the thug, if Jay wasn't dead, the thug is going to pistol whip you. But because it's Jay saying don't do it, the thug starts smiling, puts the yeah. gun away. You could go, little man. But if Jay was that right. dude. Jay was the guy with the thugs playing the hip-hop music, but he's also the guy in the park balling with the ballers. Yeah, He's, he's, he's in the park playing hard one-on-ones with uh, Mark Jackson. And all the stars that so Jay Queen's was just legends. that guy. Yeah. He was he was he was also our safety net. When we first started going around, we get a thousand dollars a show. Of course, Brooklyn and the motherfuckers want to stick us, but Jay, because Jay's was the Hollis crew is our free security. Mm-hmm. So now you ain't taking my money. I'm gonna make it out of Brooklyn tonight, right? Because the Hollis crew got guns too. So Jay, he he was our everything. But from a artistic representation of the group, I tell people if you understand what happened with the Beatles. Like, the only way Run DMC could be Run DMC, me and Run could do a record, we'll show up at Made in America, or whatever, but the only thing that, where, yo, that's from Run DMC song, mm-hmm. is if Jay, and look, I say this, when the Beatles get back together, me and Run will get back together. <laughs> As a Word group, up. me and Run are friends, there's no beef. I mean, Run had his TV show, and like, everybody thought, oh, it's wrong, Run is rich, and Russell, and everybody's rich, they treated DMC wrong, no. Run had its TV show on on t- a successful reality show yes, for 10 years. It. And for 10 years, I was thinking about jumping off a fucking bridge. Mm. I'm not mm. coming on his show. That's mm. I would probably would have came on the show. Mm. I didn't know about his show. Everywhere I went, the reason why I wrote my book to live was because of this. When I got out of rehab and I got out of therapy, the question to me was, it wasn't about your D, where you been, this and that. The question, Globe, why you ain't on Run's house? Everyone, why do you ain't on The so power like, of mass media, right? You, you want to know why I'm on Run House? Read this, motherfucker. Mm. I was thinking of killing my drinking a case of 40s. Oh, whoa, whoa. Like, that changed the whole... Now all of the Run DMC shit go out the door. Yo, really, D? Like, you? Like, you thought you were so happy. I was. Right. You know what I'm saying? Jam Master J's murder was unsolved until last summer. Um, yes. Did that give you closure or a sense of relief? Yeah, well, no, the family. It gives the family. My problem, my struggle is this. And before I even knew that it was my man's son that did it, or allegedly did it, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But, you know, they got to go through and confirm all this shit. But before I knew who it was, that's it's even more shocking to me. Like, I still ain't digested yet. You know, it's like some movie shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was just watching um, Sabotage with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And find out at the end of the movie, he's the motherfucker that took the money and let all his friends die. Like, it's a mentality problem. I had tweeted, I'm not mad at the guy that shot Jam Master J. And once again, like I sided with Gene Simmons, I got cussed out. So I had to explain myself. I said, my fight is not against the brother who shot Jay and pulled the trigger. My fight is against the mentality that would cause a motherfucker to do that because he didn't just in Jay's life, he Jay Studio was five minutes from where he grew up. Word. He could, Jay Studio could have been in a city around the corner from Diddy's studio. Jay could have had a studio in LA around the corner from Dr. Dre's. Jay Studio was five minutes from where he grew up, and everybody around him was living that life. But he said, okay, you ain't got a rap, you ain't got a DJ, 
You could be the receptionist. You learn production. You can learn management. Like Jay gave motherfuckers positions and opportunities. The guy that pulled the trigger destroyed those opportunities. So my clo- my closure won't come until not just using losing the biggies and the jam master J's in the in the in the in the truths and the preaches and the K and the, um the DJ Scott LaRance. My 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 struggle and my problem and my fight is against all the kids in Chicago getting shot, all the kids in Camden getting shot. So it wasn't a closure for me. It was a wake-up call to me because now things that I saw from afar, I never thought it was going to happen to me. And right. out of all the people that happened to happen to Jay, which is like crazy. And people say, man, that's fucked up because Run DMC. I mean, we only cursed on like three records. Mm-hmm. Like we was never that group to do that. So the shame in Jay's death is, and everybody else's, is, we died by the very thing we was able to escape from that we was using to deliver others from. So I'm trying to figure that out, you know, how my music, how my, my representation, how am I going to get us more further with the help of all my other um, all, all my other partners, such as the Talib and Chuck D and all the women and the mothers and fathers. So the closure is finally for the family because now, and me too, that we know who did it. Yeah, man, rest in peace to JMJ, Jam Master J. Um, we lost a real one with that, but his spirit is uh, so important to hip hop. Oh, for and- sure. Every DJ, everybody, like Funkmaster Flex. <laughs> Funkmaster Flex was funny. When we used to perform, he used to tell me and run, get the fuck out the way, D, stop rhyming at me. I want to see Jay. Now that's fly. He's watching the show because he knows Jay's back there. Jay yeah. is working. Like Jay didn't just push buttons and stand there and act like he was doing something. No, he was working. Jay was the music. You know, if we start another band, then, you know, like I, I still do shows. I got DJ Charlie Chan as my DJ, who was one of Jay's apprentices, mm-hmm. came up under Jay. But, you know, we our, my joke is we can't replace our drummer. We could. Right. Like, it's easy to can't start a band, our, but... Can't replace this drummer. That's right. right. The, the only way me and Run could come back is Run DMC if Jake comes down from heaven. And if we did do something, I think it's fly because our music at this point right now, and I'm always thinking, you know, superhero and scientifically, but I'm also thinking like the people that I idolize. You know, when, when um David Grohl, after Nirvana, he didn't keep Nirvana going with a new... He went fighters, and right. started... Right, and, when yeah, Allison Chains, um, um, Audio Slave went to Soundguard, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we 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 got to think like that. I don't want to be when you see me and run together. Right. It's not the same two people running around with those other right. three dudes, and people don't get that. A shout out to uh, Be Real and Chuck D and Tom Morello and the Rage dudes for Profits, Profits of Rage. Profits of Rage, right? Which is they a perfect situation. Exactly. One thing about Run DMC is that y'all became synonymous with hip hop. So like when Suck MCs dropped. It became a test amongst hip hop people. If you didn't know two years ago, a friend of mine asked me to say MC Rhyme, he wasn't hip hop. You know, <laughs> if you didn't know, is DMC in the place to be? I went to St. John's University and since kindergarten, I acquired the knowledge. And after high school, I went straight to college. Now, right. you and me spoke earlier before we got on camera about how you said something, you would say things that people would think are supposed to be considered corny, like right. going to school and being in kindergarten or right. on the on the greatest Christmas song of all time, Christmas and Hollis. You say it's Christmas time and Hollis, Queens, mom's cooking chicken and collard greens. Like you made collard greens sound hard as fuck. <laughs> you made going to college sound hard as fuck. <laughs> Did you feel like the hardness and the aggressiveness was like a uniform you were putting on, sort of like a superhero yes. persona yep. outside of who you were? Because yes, I feel 100%. like that too as a performer. Sometimes I'll, I'll dress up for stage which means having my pair of sneakers will have to be newer. I'll have to have a cap that, a specific type of cap that nobody could find, you know, and I'll, yep. I'll go out on stage and be like, okay, I put on my rap uniform. That's exactly. Okay, you know what I'm saying? I, Exactly. That's exactly what I'm, because even running, yo, D, those gloves are badass. When I used uh-huh. to put my gloves on, like in rock box, I'm standing yeah. next to, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you know, I'm suiting up like Iron Man. No mm-hmm. doubt. It's crazy. It's, you know, it's time to go to war. 
Now, I'm glad you shouted out DJ Hurricane. I want to thank him for putting me on a great record that he did. You know, obviously, he was with the Beastie Boys. I toured with the Beastie Boys. It was one of my greatest experiences. Right. I yeah. learned so much from them brothers. Yeah. Um, yeah. When uh, Rest in Peace to, to Yout, when he got sick, I, yeah. I filled in on 30 Rock for them. When the Beastie Boys first came out, mm -hmm. they were marketed as a white version of Run DMC. Exactly. Was this ever an issue for y'all, or was it always love from Jump? No, it was always love from Jump because the beauty in that was they was they wasn't white rappers trying to be black rappers. Mm -hmm. It'd have been an issue if they would have been like, "Yo, man," and, and wearing the goat chains and Adidas. Yeah. They were doing the rap thing, but they were who they were. And yeah. real mm -hmm. recognized real, like when Dr. Dre from Yo MTV Raps yeah. was their first DJ. Yeah. Before Hurricane, Dr. Dre had to leave to go do um, Yo MTV Raps with Ed Lover. So Kane was our bodyguard. He became their DJ. Right. But in the beginning, we would play Alabama. We played Tulsa. We played Black. We played Atlanta. I'm talking about the whole audience is Black. And the Beasties was opening for us. So they would go out. We, you know, first four shows, we'd stay in the dressing room because we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. <laughs> and every time they went out from day one, tremendous applause because they wasn't trying to be black. Mike D, his chain was actually the Gold Volkswagen emblem That's off right. the front of a. He put it on a plastic chain, put it on his neck. And I had my gold Cadillac with the right, diamonds. Right. He had that. His shit was more gangster. Because he was like... It was, the, right. It was more authentic. Right, they definitely was, carved out their own lane right. um, in such an amazing way. Going from License to Ill to Paul's Boutique mm. to, to check your they'd head. Have been, like, they'd have been wrong trying to be black. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They didn't. They, the, the beautiful thing about them, I used to sit with them before our shows for hours and we would sit there and we would talk about Busy B and we would talk about they, know they, they have shit a too. huge knowledge of right. They know they shit and right. they kept up with it. Like, yes. they, they kept, they, you know. You hear the influence in their records. Yeah. A lot of this routines and shit that they did was them paying homage to the shit that inspired them. No so doubt. So it was, it was never an issue and Jay, when uh, we was recording at Chung King House of Metal, where Slayer and Anthrax and, and all mm -hmm. of and the BCs was a punk group. And one day, this guy named Rick Rubin sticks his head in. Hey, guys. Mm -hmm. What's up, man? And he just started kicking with us. And that's when Rick started hanging around. He hung around mm -hmm. long enough to produce the Raising Hell album. And then I'll never forget the day he brought the BCs in to meet us. And his question to us was, yo, you think these three white guys could make a hip-hop album? And right. Jay looked over at them and he was like, why the fuck not? So... Right. We didn't want to use slow and low to live. Mm. We wasn't going to use let it flow, let yourself go. Right. Slow and low, that is the tempo. It's never old school. So the BCs was like, yo, you're not, not going to use that? And Rick was like, yo, can we get that? And we was like, yo, really want this? And it was like, yeah. So we gave it to them. And this was showed you. They could have recorded exactly the way that Run and D wrote it. I got determination based in highs. I see really well because I have four eyes. They didn't say that. They said one of the greatest lyrics in hip hop. Check this out. This blew out mine. Let's go. I got determination, face in highs, white castle fries only come in one size. <laughs> right, right, right. It's true. They do. That's when true. They, yes. They do. We was like, yo, these, yo. <laughs> so the, that, that put to see, you know, we was drinking all English. It was talking about Brass Monkey. Right. You know, they would describe a sick stick up scenario. But it wasn't like, yo, motherfucking nigga. It was from right. the beat. Mike D pulled out the jammy and just got into the yeah. room. Yeah. So, and you know and it was saying? more sounded like an old Western than a <laughs> modern day street tale. Right. So, you know, the dudes in the hood could know that because we knew of the same things. They'd have been wrong if they were trying to be black and, yo, what's up? We, you know what I'm saying? They would have flopped. But they right. were the Beastie Boys doing hip hop the way the Beasties should do it. Word up. Word up. Now... I want to talk about the song I'm Proud to Be Black because earlier in the intro I said I don't think Run DMC gets enough credit for being socially conscious. And I mean, that record was unapologetic. Like Malcolm X said, I won't turn the right cheek, got the strength to go to length if you want to start beef. That's like, like nah, we, we are on that Malcolm shit. 
Joe right. said, a motherfucker, I could never be a slave, y'all. That's something I find myself saying just about on the daily. Mm-hmm. I'm online all the time being like, yo, you know I ain't a fucking slave. Right. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. So, yeah, so it's oh, like... Right. He literally says that. I literally say that almost every day. <laughs> so right. can you tell us the history behind the um, the decision to talk about black historical figures in that way on that song? That was all um, of Spectrum City, mm-hmm. Public Enemy, Bomb Squad influence. Mm-hmm. That was our brothers in the family letting us know that we are in a um, a position of responsibility yeah, and with all this power and all of this, since the world is not going to acknowledge it, we're yeah. going to acknowledge it to let them know what's happening, even though they don't want to say it. So that was um, Dr. Dre, Chuck, um, E Money, mm-hmm. um, shout um, out to E Money. Um, wow, um, who else was uh, um, Paradise Gray? All of shout those out to dudes. Paradise Gray. Yeah, they, they was all Black involved Watch. in this movement. It worked because it wasn't it it was radical as a fuck, like you said. Yeah, it was but radical. It fit our presentation. People was already telling us when DMC is socially conscious, we was like, no, we're not. They said motherfuckers, y'all made us like that. Right. And I, we had white and hard times. Yeah, we had white and Japanese journalists and people say that to us. Oh yeah, hard times and all that. So we were yeah. so that was just that that was all public enemy, which who was family influence that and the, the 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 thing why it worked was the composition of it fit. Yeah. It wasn't corny. We it's, it goes back to right, what I was saying about right. you y'all figured out a way to say things that people were in the streets were saying, that's corny, I don't want to say right, that. Right, right, but right, y'all exactly. said it in a way it was like it's hard. Right, 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 exactly. And the cool thing about it, which crazy to live, white people were singing that shit. Yeah. When we yes, was indeed. doing our concerts, the guard, the dumb motherfucker, hell, they were saying that shit. So no it, 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 it did something so deep about empowerment. That's right. You know what I'm saying? At the time, we had no, we had no realization of what we was doing. We mm-hmm. just knew something what, what's going on. But that's even a deeper example of the power and influence of what we are capable of doing. Now, to pivot back to Rick Rubin again, um, he came with the idea to do Walk This Way. You obviously had a rock influence, um, but that song did better than the original for Aerosmith, and it reintroduced Aerosmith to a new generation. It introduced Run DMC and, by proxy, hip-hop to mainstream white America. Like, for a lot of mainstream white American fans of hip hop, Run DMC is the f- introduction to hip hop. So what's your relationship with Rick Rubin today and your relationship with Aerosmith today? they like friends. I could call Steve right now. Mm. Could call I Steve. Doubt. I could hit Rick right now. Um, I did it that Rick had, Rick has an amazing podcast. Rick yes, called yes. me up and said, do I need to talk to you? But I wanted did you to do his show yet? Yeah, I did it. Oh man, I got, I did I got. I, did. I was trying to yeah. get you before Rick Rubin. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, he called me up and he, he wanted to talk about when I discovered, when I found out that I was adopted and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But the, my relationship with Ru- Rick Rubin was is always great. I mean, you know, he worked with Run DMC, the BC Boys, uh, Metallica, Johnny Cash, mm-hmm. Ravi Shaker. Like he's he he's a guy that loves music and like he'll tell you. He said I don't write shit for them. Like he didn't write nothing. Mm-hmm. We would come to him with an idea and he'd be like, turn that up, put that over there, don't do that, or oh, don't sample it, let me play it. So he was like that. He let us live. And that's why Raising Hell was so good. He kept yeah. us from trying to conform to be, I mean, because Raising Hell was pivotal in our career because when we looked to the left, EPMD was over there. Right. When we looked to the right, Karis One was over there. Rakim was like, it was pivotal in our survival. So Rick didn't want us to go out of our lane. He yeah. wanted to enhance our lane. So to this day, it's like, hey, D, what's up? What you doing? Come on over. So right. a, a great relationship. Uh, one story I got to tell about Rick, too, to let people know how incredible he is. When we did Peter Piper, because if you listen to Peter Piper, it starts with that Run DMC energy, that punch yeah. of Peter Piper, Peter Pepper. That's right. That energy was it's it's kept up throughout the whole song, except on one part. It's the part where when I break off from my little freestyle bars, 
chased like King Midas, as I was told, was told everything, everything that he, that he touched, touched turned to go. Turned so to go. for me, after we finished the session and I um, took it, took the tape home that night, I'm listening to it and it wasn't up in that register. Piper, Peppers, Bronze, Dumpty, Damn. Before I left the studio, I'm like, yo, Rick, I need to do my rhyme over. Nah, D, leave it. I'm telling you, it's perfect. No, Rick, I really need to do my rhyme over. So it's like 3.30 in the morning. Um, I'm, I'm high on coke. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, the, the coke and the weed and the old English and the... um. Fuzzy Mabels and the screwdrivers and the Bacardi. And, oh, it's a lot. Like, it's a lot. That's too much. It's too much. Yeah. It's too well, much. Yeah. But this is before Hennessy and Kavasa, all the Kavasa. <laughs> so Rick goes, all right, if you want to change your verse, be here tomorrow at 11 in the morning. So it's 3.30. He thought I wasn't going to show up. So I show up to Chung King the next morning because I was adamant on changing that because I felt the record went from here to here. And I wanted that energy to continue. So I get to the studio at 11 in the morning. All right, Rick goes, go in there and do your round. So I go in there, and instead of going, Jay's like King Midas, as I was told, everything, I'm going in, I'm like, Jay's like King Midas. Ah, really? <laughs> and I finished. So Rick That's says, how I hear it in my head, too. Yeah, so, so Rick, Rick hits the button, you finish? I'm like, yeah, I'm finished. Come in here. He sits me down, and he says, okay, this is what you just did. And I listen to it. Jay's like King Midas, as I was told, everything. Uh, and this is what you did yesterday. Jay's like King Midas, as I was told, everything that he... He says, which one sounds better? The one I did last night. Get the fuck out of here and go home. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what's I've beauty? I've had that experience so many times. Yeah. Man. He said, yeah, you, have, that's a, you need a producer you sometimes. You don't know until yeah. you know, though. He said, yo, the beauty in that, he says, yo, D, after busted, after you doing that, that explosive energy with Run, for you to drop down there so effortlessly will let motherfuckers know, yo, don't fuck with that motherfucker. That's so a good producer. If you, that's a great producer. Hell yeah. Me and Run originally was going to sample Walk This Way and put Yes, Yes, Y'all and Echoes. And Run's whole thing was, I love Run. I love Joe so much because he's crying to Russell and Rick and Jay because I always had rhymes. Like Run, right. Run wasn't a prolific writer. He would write for the song or he mm. would write one day when he's inspired have right. it for the album. All I did was write every day. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So Run was crying to Rick, we don't want to do the record over the way they did it. We never heard, tell it, me and Run never heard the vocals. Right. All we know is the first 30 seconds of the record with right, Jay's Ratchet. The beat part, right. So Run's whole thing was, d got rhymes. d got rhymes. <laughs> okay, I never forget your cry. d got rhymes. Our thing was, rock rap is rock box and king of rock. Put the damn record on, we're going to talk about how great we are. Yeah. I still remember my rhyme. It's supposed to go, it's supposed to be a loop of the guitars and just the hard drums. And my rhyme was, I'm DMC in the place to be. Been rhyming on the mic since 83. I'm the best MC in history. There will never be an MC better than me. That's why they call me K-I-N-G. And then when I did that, Ron was supposed to go, and I'm DJ Ron and I'm number one. Here to get it done and half. You know how we do that. Yeah. We're just going to do the record like that. Rick said, no. Go home. Go to D's basement, learn the record the way the band did it. And that decision... That was a genius idea. Smart. I tell kids now, always be open to try something new because it might not only just change your life, it could change the world. It changed the world. There's a whole and, book written about this crazy. record. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Walk the, This the, Way book. Walk This Way, that the, the song that By changed... By Jeff Edgers. I learned stuff about it that I didn't even know. All up behind <laughs> like, the scenes. Wow, I really did change. change the world. How yeah, about that? I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, this is, I, I am incredible. What the hell yeah. is... <laughs> I, thought, I thought we just did a remake. So yeah. um, for TikTok, when Tricky became popular again, did you have like a newer audience downloading the song or were they just oh, playing it? Oh my goodness. I love it. I love for anybody <laughs> I, I love you for asking me that because you know how relevant I am now. <laughs> Dude, do you know how? Do you know how famous I am now because of TikTok? I am. The, two things happened. I was I was in a supermarket and the lady from my era sees me and loses it. And just gives me my whole history. Got to take a picture. She there with her twelve year old daughter. The 12-year-old daughter's pulling on her. Mommy, mommy, who's that? The, the, the mother's saying, leave me the fuck alone. You don't know that. Leave me. So she, the daughter's being persistent. So the mother goes, it's run DMC, leave me alone. Who? Run it. And she just turns to him. 
that it's tricky man. <laughs> it's over it's now. Man. The, the daughter, she's going, oh, my, oh, can I get him? Like the daughter right away, did you make the tricky record? Like crazy. Mm. About four weeks ago, because during the school season, because of COVID, I, I, 95% of what I do, if I ain't enrolled, I visit schools, mm -hmm. middle schools and high schools and talk. So this year, I mean, last year I couldn't do it. So the teachers was calling me just to check up on me. Yo, we really miss you this year. As soon as COVID's over, we bring you back. So one principal from this, um, the school out here in Jersey, where I live at, calls me and says, yo, D, I got a bone to pick with you. You'll never believe this. Well, I just had a fight with my eight-year-old daughter. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm walking by her room, and I'm hearing this tricky on. So I run in there, and she's looking at Tricky on TikTok, and I go, honey, I know him. That's my <laughs> friend. He, he's the guy that I brought to the school last year to talk, and he's giving a history. His eight-year-old daughter, no, daddy. Stop, daddy. Stop trying to be cool, daddy. Stop, try <laughs> Stop trying to be relevant, daddy. This is That's not funny. Run DMC, Daddy. This is the TikTok song. <laughs> this is the TikTok song. She's telling her, Daddy, get your ass out my room. You're not <laughs> relevant. This is the TikTok song. But so to answer your question, the, the, yes, it's amazing. Oh That's and hard, it's not just these little kids, that, um, the college kids that go to my gym. They uh -huh. walk in and every day, they go, why didn't you tell me who you are? <laughs> I'm like, what? He says, yo, your, 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 your song is trending all. Like, it's amazing. I'm That's so beautiful, bro. Yeah, man. I'm so thankful. That's, That's like awesome. amazing. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. But I'm a TikTok <laughs> man. Yeah. yeah. And that was a trend. Now back to business. <laughs> uh, when Run DMC toured with Raising Hell, you guys were met with a lot of violence, especially in L.A. And you guys yeah. were blamed because you were the face of hip hop and people were blaming hip hop for the violence. So yeah. you guys um, faced that with doing a bunch of peaceful concerts. How mm -hmm. hard was it to change the message? You know, it really wasn't that hard. The hard part was just having enough courage to stand up and speak on it. You got Run DMC, the Beastie Boys, Houdini, and LL Cool J touring, selling out these big coliseums, venues, and sports arenas. Go listen to all of that music, and you tell me one lyric in there that glorifies, promotes, or incites what's been going on in our communities. None. This is a deep community problem. And let it also be said that, look, College kids, white people, Asians, grandmothers, grandfathers, B-boys, B-girls, drug dealers, and gangbangers love this hip-hop music. So that's who's coming to the concert. The problem at the Long Beach concert was the two rival gangs showed up at the same time to the concerts. Yeah. And what I, I had to explain it like this. You got two high school football teams. From the, mm -hmm. the east side and the west side high school. Now, the high school football teams handle their problems on the field. But what's going to happen when the students from east side go to the mall mm -hmm. and see the students from the west side before the game on Sunday? Something is going to go down. And we didn't really understand that. I mean, our gangs died out with the formation of the Zulu Nation. And people don't right. know that um, New York City, the Bronx, I mean, the, the, the Black Skull, Savage Skull, Savage, we had street gangs galore. When this hip hop thing came together, we found a way to creatively and constructively and positively put out our fighting um, egotistical energies into something yeah. else. You know what I'm saying? It's so like that Cedric the Entertainer. Cedric the Entertainer makes a joke about this at Kings of Comedy. He said, yeah, it was breakdance fighters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I remember getting into Long Beach that morning for the sound check. And I remember this young man, he was on a um, Huffy bicycle. And he, where the buses was pulling in, you know, somewhere by the back fences. So yeah. he comes riding. It's like, it's a scene right out of the movie. We on the other side of the fence. And he's riding by and he's hugging the fence. And he looks over at me running JC and Ron DMC. What up, yo? He says, <laughs> it's going down tonight. <laughs> so we didn't know. We thinking, yeah, we're going to rock that. Yeah, it's going yeah. down tonight. We didn't know. He was saying, it's, it's going, going down. down tonight. But 
the way he said, and we reacted to, yeah, you, yep, you damn right, hell yeah, we gonna yeah. raise. Him. We had no idea that the Beasties made it through their show. Mm-hmm. When Houdini got on the show, as soon as they said Grandmaster D rock the beat, mm-hmm. you know how they start this show, Juku Juku Grand, yeah man. As soon as Grandmaster D, yeah, rest in peace, another one, yeah man, a lot of rest in pieces. But as soon as uh, Houdini dropped that beat, all pandemonium broke out. And I remember Runny Ray, rest in peace again. He runs in our dressing room. Yo, they're killing each other out there. So, I, you know, me and Runny Jay, we was in the dressing room the whole time. So Ray, he was able to go out, you know, back and forth. I'm going to go look again. So he was giving us the 411. But to defend it, all we had to do was say, listen to Run DMC's music. I'm right. telling motherfuckers, go to school. Right. Houdini, oh, right. Houdini's all about one love. One, right. You know what I'm saying? Let's be friends. LL Cool J, my radio, you know, the BC Boys was very raunchy and X-rated, but there was nothing that would validate you saying we're causing what's happening here. That's right. That's and, right. And 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 we, the proof was in the pudding. That's right. Or 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 like like um um Ab Soul said on that dope rhyme that he had on Russ record. What, there right. you go. You heard that? And I was like, oh, that's what? Let Another great that. West Coast representer. Yes, sir. Um, Abso, back. shout out to Abso, the homie Abso, also from the West Coast, mm-hmm. is MC Hammer. Now, yes. when I was a kid, I hated MC Hammer. Really? Today, we have a great what? relationship today. Really? You hated him? I How? hated him, and I'm going to tell you why. Wow. Because he dissed Run DMC. Oh, yes, and me did. and my friends, when that Pump It Up video came out, we was like, what? Fuck MC Hammer. How wow. MC Hammer going diss run DMC now? MC Hammer, I met him on Twitter. He invited me over to the crib. Wow. I know more about the history and the legacy of Stanley Burrell and what that man has brought to this culture than wow. I did when I was just a fan and all of it was abstract to me. And it right. wasn't the possibility of me ever meeting, meeting this person. But right. can you tell me what was on your mind and what was going on with that situation with Hammer way back when? I loved him and I was hurt when he dissed me. Mm. I lo- Run hated him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jay hated him because he had to, but Run right. hated him. Uh-huh. Like, who's this fake, like, whatever. I right. loved Hammer. I thought he was that thing. Right. You know, it's especially coming from me, everybody was so stuck in their hip hopness. I was hurt when he did that. Mm. But then I understood when he, I saw it was an interview or something that he did or somebody wrote why Hammer this my DMC. But when he did it, when I first saw MC Hammer, I I knew he wasn't Karis One. I knew mm-hmm. he wasn't Moldy. He was my generation James Brown. When I saw MC Hammer, he was David Bowie, Elton John to me. But, you know, I was quiet back then, so nobody knew. I loved him, everything about him. I loved the fact that he sampled Rick James. Like, yeah. Even though it was some other shit, I wasn't really in the other shit. I didn't put him in our category. But um, from what I understand, he said we came to Oakland on the Fresh Fest or Raising Hell, and he walked up to Russell and said, yo, I'm MC Hammer, I'm hot from Oakland, this and that. Could I come in? Something like that. And he said, Russell dissed him. That's what so, he depicted at the beginning of that video. So he was hurt. Yeah. So, so naturally, he had to retaliate. But right. I, lo- I, I, I thought Hammer was amazing to have a doll and all this food shit and a cartoon. Right, the cereal, the cartoon. The se- right. And everybody yeah. was hating him. And now everybody in hip hop wants to do that even before making some quality music. That's true. They want to skip, they want to skip making the good songs. Yeah, they want to get the he's, cereal. What he is and what he did was pioneering because it was deserving of that. Yeah. Now, it was a little different. It was such a grandiose, extravagant, powerful display of performance that we still, even though we was liked and we still was love, we still was still a little too black yeah. or street. Let me yeah. see. Because Hammer was black. And that's what I mean. Hammer was that James Brown yeah. figure of us. We was still too gold chain. You know, and it was surprising to me. I remember about 20 years ago when I heard Run said this. Run was like, yo, man, but they was we were so black that <laughs> we were so black, but still because of who our 
folding our arms, that look that we had, we never got to cover a jet. <laughs> right. We never got to cover Ebony, not because right. of you. Not even Ebony our, Man. Our attitude. None of that. <laughs> Because why? Right. We had to go, and we was, you know what I'm saying? We was the hood. When we did Madison and Grant, we didn't jump in limos. We walked out that side door. We walked down 7th Avenue. And I remember mm. as we was crossing the street, we had a boom box. Hurricane was with us, whatever, whatever. I would hear car doors lock. Wow. Because we looked like sick of kids. Right. You know what I'm saying? I got my 40 in the hand, you know, Jade, Bid, and, and the Hollis crew. You know what I'm saying? Little Harold, we walking through the streets. We about to pull motherfuckers out and carjack. So <laughs> Hammer's situation, he was hurt that the thing that he loved, he wanted to, yo, I can acknowledge me. Mm-hmm. God's, mm-hmm. his God's distant. But I, you know, I yeah. never had a problem. I don't think Jay had a problem because Jay was fly too. And yeah. Jay being a run had a problem with him. Yeah, run spoke out at the, what, at the Grammys? Yeah, fake yeah. motherfuckers. And then uh, <laughs> on a, on our worst album ever, uh, Back From Hell, when Jay had us doing fucking New Jack Swing. Hey, I'll, just that's a whole caveat. other story. I like Pause, man. Pause was all right. I, I, I like, like you for saying it. <laughs> pause was all right. I was, was rolling with a dancer up. crew at that time. And yeah. New, New Jack Swing, that Teddy Riley sound was so prevalent. Y'all danced to it. You Y'all can dance to it. It was a you go in the clubs. I read club your dance record. Yeah, you, right. But fit it, it, but it, I hated it. And that <laughs> that led to my mental issues. Yeah, and we'll talk no. about that. But let me just say, on a, we did a song called Faces, and Runs Rhyme sucked knuckleheads in our face for a second. Go listen to Faces. Runs Rhyme okay. is directed at Hammer with Jay backing them up. Oh hmm. gosh. And yeah. I'm li- I'm listening to Faces, and I'm going, why why are you dissing Hammer? Like I but, like MC Hammer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but how it reminds that me of that of De La Soul st- dead skit with uh with Mr. Long and Dreads. And they're like, yo, yo, I, I, yes. I like it. It's got shut yo, shut the fuck up. Yes. yes. <laughs> yep. yeah. So that's why I didn't I say like nothing. it. I think that I, shit is I don't want shut the fuck up. up. <laughs> but no, um pause is okay. Mm-hmm. But when I go back to pause, pause was okay. It was Stanley Brown. It's nostalgia for it me. It was a great it reminded record. me of watching Rap City your I video hated, music box. I hated every minute of it. Wow. Why? Because Cool G Rap was doing you lose, but you got the ill yeah. street food. I'm like, I got all these fucking rhymes on me and this and motherfucker. But the bad thing is, this is what I'm thinking that I should have spoke up and quit the group but instead of doing that, I would suppress my feelings and emotions with the 40s. So I would right. just go do to imagine how you feel. I'm totally against it. But just to be, to make Jay and Run like me, don't want to cause no trouble. I'm, and like you said, pause was good. You know, pause was good. I froze for Danny. But to live, it's mm-hmm. fucking traumatic to me. Because I go back and look at the video. Jay got me in a green, purple, and orange Suit made by Walker wear, and I'm doing the running man. I used to like that suit. Back. And I didn't even know you could dance. I remember this very clearly. Yes. I was like, I did not know DMC could dance like that. I try to put some, I try to put my feeling in there when you see mm-hmm. me with the, uh, the, the the nylon blazer mm-hmm. and the, the, the Kango, the Applejack Kango. I tried, that's how I felt. I didn't. <laughs> right. But I didn't speak up. That was the beginning of the thing where I, I, I wanted to jump off a bridge. That was just Man, part no. of it, though. And th- 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 what I'm saying is, I should have said, fuck you, Jay. I'm not doing that bull. Not, hold up. I love New Jack Swing. I love Teddy. Yeah. I love yeah. Paws. I lo- but I'm not doing it. Like, my therapist yeah. said, CD, you should say, I quit. I don't care about your fucking money because I hate it to live. Mm. <laughs> like, dude, I hate it because it's not me. Yeah. It's, that's what I mean by it. It's beautiful. My rhyme was cool, you know, but I hate that. That took so much away from me that I'm trying to, well, let me not say that. That's not good therapy. That took a lot. I had so much more to offer that I wasn't allowed to. So I should have said, y'all put this out. Let me go solo while y'all do this album, and then I'll come back when y'all start doing some rock and right. shit. That's just I'm, where I was at. Word, word. I didn't want to do New Jack Swing. And Dante Ross, shout out to my man Dante shout Ross. Shout out to Dante Ross, whose name comes up on this show a all lot. the time. All right, so DMC, that means he's real deal. 
He's the only one from day one, from as soon as that record came out, that talked about it the way I felt. What the <laughs> fuck are they doing? They right. ruined, like, but it's funny. The Saving Grace was a couple of years later when Pete Rock did Down With The King for us. Because Down yeah. With The King did for Run DMC what Walk This Way did for Aerosmith. Brought us we back. Just, we just spoke to Pete Rock about that, man. I was like, I read an interview where you said, we were working with Naughty by Nature, we were working with Tribe Called Quest, all these younger groups that looked up to us, but yeah. we worked with Naughty, we sound like Naughty, we worked with Tribe, we sound like Tribe, but Pete Rock was able to get that Run DMC sound. That's why he talks about working with Jam Master Jay and Jay tracking out the beat with him and Jay really giving him the direction on where to go with that. So yeah, yeah. Jay was Jay was making you do the running man, but he was right. also three years right. later working right. with Pete. Right, right, right. But, but Jay didn't make me do the running man. See, okay, okay. The, that's what I had to go in therapy. My therapy did it, said, yeah. why did you do it? And my only answer was, I didn't want running Jay mad at me. And my mm. therapist said, but that's not healthy. That's right. You could have you said, well, my part come on, Go to fucking chance to the drummer's beat or some shit. Like, right. He right. said it's compromise. And I said, I did not know I was allowed to. I didn't want to, because Joe put me on. I don't want to be the guy, you know, but th the bad thing is you grow and change. If you look at Jay, every generation, he his flavor changed. Yeah. He had braids, he had dreads, yep. he had color, he had then this he had and the that. onyx era. Right. So if he's allowed to do that, and, and my therapist said, look at Run. This he went from this to Reverend Run. They you you allowed them to make you think you're only the guy from Sucker and Seeds because that was their safe zone. Yeah. Now, we don't need D saying anything else except what he does. You know, if yeah. you, if you, I'm a, I, it was my influence by Sha Rock. I was influenced by a girl for the Echo thing. The, my name is DMC, C, all time great, great, great. with the yeah. Echo, like um, um, Bun B does it, and Nice and Smooth, Greg That's Nice right. does it. When I did it on Run's House and all my records, that's because I heard a tape of Shah Rock. To all of you, my name is Shah. Shah, I'm not a millionaire. I don't. Shah Rock and the Funky Four got these legendary tapes where whoever was pushing the button for their echoes, go listen to some Funky Four at um, Black Door and T Connection. I'm talking about the grainy, hard to hear live recording. Yeah. There's something superb about the echoes. I want, I want to do what you got to do what that girl does. That was my whole yeah. thing. So that always worked for me. So Run being a perfectionist and 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 he he's the guy you know I, I describe Run as anal as Jay Z, yeah, or nervous as Jay Z. So Run is like Nadi, you don't do anything else except what works for you, right? So and I allowed that to happen to me. So there was nothing against. I, I, it was just that the Dante Ross should have possessed me. He should have went to a witch doctor and said, <laughs> so DMC can curse Jay out and not have y'all do that. Nothing against it. It just that I had so much other shit that I wanted to do. I had a right. song called Chill With A Mill, Somebody Still Got Beef. Chill With A Mill, Somebody Still Got Beef. Chill With A Mill, which is More Money, No Problems. So right. when Biggie's More Money, No Problems came out seven years, two, you know, four years later, I really wanted to shoot Running Jay. <laughs> you actually because, got to work with Biggie on um the yes, downfall record too. That was that was uh, yeah. That was that was that was a, a, a honorable, humbling moment, and one of the most traumatic moments of my. I was like, he want me? Like imagine me getting a, that yeah. call from Diddy Puffy. Eric calls me. Puffy wants to speak to you. What? Huh, <laughs> huh, what you want to do? And he was like, we don't want to sample you because you know where he took it from. He took it from Run DMC live at Hollis Park, where I say that's not all MCs have the goal to pray, pray and plan and for pray mind for down, down for so Puffy said, We want you to come in, but we want you to change the words a little bit so I ain't gotta pay for the sample. Right. But for me to do, you know how soup that was? Yeah. You know how soup at that time, everybody was saying Run DMC's OGs over pioneers. I'm like, motherfucker, I'm on the record with Biggie. Right, with Biggie Smalls, who was robbing motherfuckers since running them and saying, in, here we go. At the Roxy. At, your, at the at Roxy, the Roxy. boy, you ain't know. Yeah, man. So that was um, full circle for me to live. That that's was full like, circle, I was like, yeah. what? Because imagine, the cool thing for me is, I mean, it's certain MCs, Nas, my man Freddie Fox, mm -hmm. um, G Rap. I'm talking about the greatest lyricists in the game, Big Daddy Kane. They go, yeah, yeah, we all right, but you, D. They'll just yeah. give me my little moments where they say, yo, when you said that shit, 
the, the shit that blows uh, people's head out, I cut the head off the devil. The unbelieving receiving prophecy so true. I cut the head off the devil and I throw it at you. Yeah. All of them goes, what makes you think yeah. of that? But that's yeah. comic book shit. But when Biggie called me, it, imagine that at the height of his shit, I'm like, I'm with that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm I was like, Kaz yeah. calling me. So that, that, that was a saving grace. You was in his DNA. He was yeah. wrong about it. The same way I was concerned, I felt like a protector of Run DMC as a fan when Hammer dished y'all. I felt the same way when I, I, because I, I bought Back from Hell and I was a consumer and I listened to it and I was, I was playing it. And there's a song I don't know if it's on Back from Hell. There's a song Peep, Peep on a Tree. That's on Back from Hell. That's on Back from Hell, right? Yeah. And it's it's funny, but I remember thinking, D might have a drinking problem when I, I heard. I really it. was doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you had the forty ounce crew? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The Afros and 40 ounce crew. I, I but that was like, the celebrant. That was the that was Kane and them. Afros, mm -hmm. 40 ounce crew. Yeah. They named me that because I always had 40s. Right. Right. Eight forties so a day. You it said made me point. right. It made me. We were celebrating not normal behavior. It's cool if your friend, yo, he could drink two forties. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a problem in drinking a case. Mm. I didn't know there was a deeper problem of why I was doing that. Yeah. And you went into the, the the drinking along with the performing at that high level, screaming, using your voice in that way. And I want to pronounce this right: spasmodic uh, dysphonia. dysphonia. Yes, as a bad vocal condition you developed at that time. Any vocal issues are scary for an MC to deal with. Right. I had a polyps issue. Buster Damn. Rhymes famously went through that. Wow. How scary was that? To to think I might not have be no, able to use my voice in the way I want to use it. It wasn't scary. No, it was true. It was over. Mm. When that, that happened, it all, we put Down With The King out. Down mm -hmm. With The King puts us back on the chart, backs on the road and everything. When we did the Down With The King video, everybody showed up. Easy e flew from LA on his own dime. Just, what, can I be in the video? I'm coming. You only got to mm -hmm. pay. So excuse me on the Down With The King video. Yeah. So. It's a that, triumphant moment for hip hop, that video. Yes, right. So the very next day I wake up and I go, I don't want to live no more. Not knowing why, it was just, why am I thinking this? D, you got to kill yourself. You got to, what? Shut the fuck up, D. Like all of this stuff. And you got to understand, I'm not drinking at that time because in 1990, I got diagnosed with um, 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 acute pancreatitis. So when I got out to hospital in 90, the doctor said, son, you have two choices. You could drink and die or not drink and live. So I'm sober that whole mm. time. Now down with the king comes out. I wake up and I go, I don't want, I don't know what it is. I look at my life. All right, run DMC. I don't know what it is, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm going through all of these emotions. We're performing at Nassau Community College in Long Island. I'll never forget the day. It was a blizzard on that day in 93. So it might have been November or December. And I remember we're doing a show and when we get to the like the seventh record, my voice starts cracking. And Run notices it. Yo, D, your voice still crack, cool. So then we go do three more shows, cool. After that fourth show crack, cracked, then it just started elevating, cracking, cracking, crack, crack. It got to the point where I couldn't even talk. I didn't know what it was. Maybe it's from yelling too much. Maybe it's from right that. I go to every doctor possible. They do all these tests on me. We don't know how to tell you this, son. You have spasmodic dysphonia. Now, there's two types. There's abductor spasm and there's adductor, like the machines in the gym, abductor and ab. AB and AD. We don't know how to tell you this, son, but you have both. Oh my when God. I got that diagnosis, that was the whole day of me starting to say, if I can't run, there's no purpose in me being here no more. So that's when the depression went and figure out how to kill yourself, D. Because at the time, I did not know that even if I never rhyme again, if my voice never comes back, life is beautiful. But you can't tell me that because from the day I graduated from high school, all I knew was this King of Rock shit. So yeah. imagine the 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 phys the metaphysical yeah. problem now. Because my mind ain't saying, don't worry, D, it's going to be a this and that. My mind is saying, my life is over. And that's, that's when those suicidal thoughts began.
Wow. We're glad to have you here with us. Let's not stop there. So imagine me dealing with that from 93 all the way to like 96. So in 1996, the day that I said, I'm finally going to kill myself. This is in my book, 10 Ways Not to Commit Suicide, the book that I wrote after Respect Responsibility. The day that I said, I'm going to kill myself. But before I leave this earth, people know the king of rock, dude. They know you could Google, you could Wikipedia, you know what me running Jay did. Before I leave this earth, I want people to know who Daryl is. You know what I'm saying? Daryl's the guy that made DMC possible. I don't have no voice. My life is over. I'm going to jump off the George Washington Bridge. But before I go, I want to leave you this. I want to tell y'all, hey, what's up, world? I'm Daryl McDaniels. You know me. One third of the groundbreaking rap group run DMC. Yeah. First to go gold, first to go platinum, first on a cover Rolling Stone, first with the sneaker deals. Everything that people say hip hop is doing is because of me running Jay. But That's I'm right. really just Daryl McDaniels from Hollis, Queens, New York, I was born May 31st, 1964. Happy and when I got to that, yeah, when I, thank you. Yeah, my birthday was yesterday. So when I got to that identifying part about me, I go, oh, I know the date of my birthday, but I don't know no details. So I call my mother up, mom, I'm writing this book. I want to know three things about the day I was born. How much did I weigh? What time? And what hospital? She tells me, I love you, son. I love you too, mom. Hung up the phone. An hour later, she calls back with my father. Now, I don't got no voice. There's no reason for me to live. I'm going to do this book, and I'm going to go kill myself. She calls back with my father. Hey, son. Hey, dad. What's going on? We have something else to tell you. Okay, what is it? Well, you was a month old when we brought you home, and you're adopted, and we love you. Bye. Click. Wow. Imagine hearing that after getting diagnosed with spasmodic nephrotic. Wow. Right then and then when I heard that. Now, I didn't know. I got, oh, this is crazy. All of these emotions and all these thoughts. I didn't, and I'm the mighty DMC. I didn't know therapy, help, suicide lines. My saving grace was alcohol. <laughs> so immediately my mind goes alcohol. I went and found Jack Daniels and Jim Bean. Mm. They became my best friends. I know them. Me too. Jack, Jack and Jim. Jim. And, I, and, and it took a little while. It took like four years. And then I found out they didn't have my best interest at hand. That's right. And people forced me to go to rehab. And, it, and Now, I went to rehab to stop drinking. But it was in rehab where I found the most powerful thing that a man, woman, kid, child, person could do was this thing called therapy. Mm. It was like, DMC, we're going to send you into therapy. They gave me, they gave me um, when I went to rehab, they put the 10 characteristics of an addictive personality on a blackboard. And I was all of them. Wow. So, and I admitted that. So the guy was like, that's the first step to victory. So they gave me these nine assignments. I had to learn about dopamine. I had to learn about LSD, alcohol. I had to learn spirituality, all of this stuff like that. So I was in rehab for a month. I went in on um, March 1st. I was getting out March 30th. Before you leave, you got to finish these nine compositions and assignments. I finished all of mine in two weeks. <laughs> so they were like, yo, this guy's crazy. But make a long story short, after I did that, it was like, there's nothing left for you to go into therapy. And I went into therapy. And the first question the doctor asked me was, he came in. I was 35 years old. He came in and he sits down and he got his clipboard and got his suit on. And he says, Daryl. During your time with Run DMC, did Russell, the management, Run J, or anybody ever do anything to upset you? And to live, I was sitting there, I was like, nah. And he looked at me, he was a white guy about 45, 46 years old. He looked at me, right? True story. He puts the clipboard down and he stands up, right? And he starts unbuttoning his white cloak. And I'm looking at him like, yo, this is about to beat my ass or something. <laughs> and he takes off his cloak. True story, he takes off his cloak and he got an ACDC shirt on. So I guess he heard that I like rocket. And he said, I guess he wanted to connect with me. And he sits down me and he looks me in my eye and he says, You a goddamn motherfucking liar. liar. And you've been motherfucking lying to yourself all these goddamn motherfucking years. And when he did wow. that, it hit the core. Wow. And everything just poured out. He said, D, he said, I was diagnosed with suppressed emotions. And what that is, is if somebody said something I didn't like or did something I like or 
I was doing stuff that I didn't want to do just to please other people. I don't want to be the troublemaker. I want people to accept me. Everybody, Dean's the nice guy. He was living up to that. He said, that's not healthy. He said, if you're holding it, if you didn't agree with them and you left that meeting and didn't speak up, he said, motherfucker, that's why your voice is gone. You're not yeah. using your real voice. Wow. He said, yo, your existence is telling you that. He said, he said, you was fine when you was, I'm DMC from Hollis, Queens, chicken and collard greens. But when it came to stuff about your fucking emotions, the same motherfucker that rhyme about that fucking St. John's University should stand up in the room and say, Russell, I'm not doing that with right. that voice. But you didn't want to do that. You wanted to suppress it all of these years. So of course your voice is going to go. Wow. And then they do a checkup on me. And the doctor in rehab and therapy says, D, there's nothing physically wrong with your voice. Wow. So I went into Sinai metaphysically thinking something with the, and it manifests itself. When this guy told me all those truths right then, and when he said, they're running them to, I went back to 85, I went back to pause, and he said, all this shit is mm. flowing out perfectly. And when he discharged me, he said, from now on, D, you got to be selfish. He said, the most important person in the room with everybody is you. Put yourself mm -hmm. first. And if they don't like it, fuck them. And it's fuck a two-way street. If you start doing it, you better be ready for them to do it. But he said, by you That's doing it, your health is going to be fine. So now to live, yo, D, let's go there. Nope. Come on, D, they're going to give you 50 grand. I don't like the venue. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't like the wallpaper. Right. That wallpaper, he said, life is set. Our lives is not about what you have, who you are, what you want to be. Our life is about feeling good about everything you do. Mm. Your life is about feeling good about everything you do. I did pause, not that I was against it, but I didn't like it. It was a feeling that I held, and that yeah. shit just waited for the opportunity to explode. Yeah. And that's so for, for therapy, I tell people the therapist doesn't help you. And they go, so what the fuck do you go for? The therapist is a decoy so you can do two things. I don't care if you're a man, woman, child, white person, black, especially as black people because we front. The therapist is a decoy so you could do two things. Say stuff to yourself that you said to yourself years ago and didn't listen to or say something to yourself. Not the therapist tell you. You say something in the therapy that you need yeah. to hear. And... Ever since then, now is my manager, they got to go with it. My publicist called me, do you want to go do? Nope. I don't want to do. Nope. I don't want to be on American Idol. I don't want to be power on. power of no. I don't want to be on White Chicks. I don't want, nope. What are you going to do? I'm staying home and reading comic books because that's what <laughs> makes me feel good. So that's that when right. it's Amen. time for me, when it's time for me to get on stage, when it's time for me to make a record, when it's time for me to show up, I'll be in right mind, sound mind, and body. That's Anything right. else is con 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 contrary to that. I don't need to reach for outside substance to make me function in anything. I have right chills. Up. That really touched me. Right up. And that's how I live every day now. Truth be told, admitting th that you're weak, admitting that you're confused, admitting that you're scared, that's power. Because once you admit that the thing that you need to succeed or get through will be revealed to you. Mm -hmm. But if I hide behind it, I ain't scared. I'm going to go out there and fail. So now my truth, yo, I, 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 I'm scared to death of doing interviews. But I do them mm -hmm. so well now because I'm saying what I'm feeling. I don't care if I hurt anybody's feelings, saying how I feel. It's not saying, so. I don't never say somebody's, look, the mumble rappers ain't wrong. Mm-hmm. And I'm able to go into high schools and tell, I scared the kids the other day to live. Well, two years ago, I was speaking at a high school in the Bronx. And I said, I understand your mobile rappers. I'm right with you. And the kids got scared because each generation, if the, if the old man digs what you like, you ain't cool. <laughs> right. I That's shook right. the whole room and I said, um, because I can relate to what you're going through because they said the same thing about me. Well, what do you mean, DMC? Listen, I said, when we started, we was hip hop to hip hip to hop. The critics said, they ain't saying nothing. The critics right. said, we ain't making real music. The critics said, they don't rate me music. I said, the only difference between our generation and your generation is when they criticized us, we did something about it to show 
oh, you think I just do mumble rap? So we made the message. We made Planet Rock. Tupac made Dear Mama. Tupac, Brenda had, and then we still did our, our fun shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So what, I, what I'm trying to say is I don't criticize nobody because now I see myself in everybody. That's you it. You know what I'm saying? That's it right there. And that's, right. that's, that's, that, that's really the victory. But, but to answer your question, the spasmodic dysphonia, um, Taleb, I was dead. I was dead. I was dead to my wife and son. I was dead to Eric. I was dead to everybody. And a, a, a part of that saving grace, I talk about this in my 10 Ways book, my manager, Eric, took me to Clive Dave Grammy party. He took me to Clive Dave Grammy party, and I didn't want to go, but I went, and my manager said, big shout out to Buster Rhymes. I saw Buster. He rolls up on me at the front door of the Grammy party, and you know Buster. Yeah. Can I have everybody's attention, please? <laughs> He's putting me on this plate. To live, I'm depressed, I'm suicidal, I have no voice. And Bust is saying, these guys, this is hip hop standing in front of you. They changed everything the way we do. Like, yeah. And you know how Bust, he, he hugs me, putting his sweaty face on my yeah. cheek. <laughs> <laughs> he does that to you, right? Put, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's, you feel love that it. love. Yeah, and he walks away and I'm like, wow. And then, um, this is funny. Stevie Wonder walks in, but he don't see me. His assistant. <laughs> that's a funny that is joke. funny. Yeah. <laughs> Stevie Wonder walks in, he don't see me. His boy, his assistant sees me. Right. And his assistant, it's funny, he's walking in with C. His assistant, he's right in my eyes. And, you know, Stevie's walking this way, and his assistant's like this. He takes Stevie and goes, <laughs> Stevie, you gotta go over there and speak to me. Because he wanted to meet me. Right. Stevie Wonder comes over to me, dude, yo, cat. Stevie's telling me how great run DMC and we chat. I'm like, what? Sarah McLaughlin walks in, and prior to me going to Clive Davis' party, I'm listening to her song, Angel, the whole year. That's the Brilliant only song. thing that made me feel good in the midst of all of this darkness, despair, and death. So mm. she sees me. She Makes comes me. over. Yeah. She comes over, and she says, DMC? Run DMC. And she starts going, it's tricky to rock around. Rock around. <laughs> she was on TikTok walk that day. This, <laughs> yeah, she was like, walk this way, my right. beaters. And I'm in my head going, CD, that's a good reason to stay alive. Even Sarah mm -hmm. McLaughlin you likes your music. So I just tell her, Miss McLaughlin, I just want to say your songs, name the song is Angel. You sound like an angel. People say you are an angel. But I said, you're God to me. I listen to your song. It's the only thing that makes me feel great. So she says, thank you for telling me that, Daryl. That's what music is supposed to do. Shakes my hand and walks away. And then it was a little bit after that where um, I got the courage to go find my birth mother because I was dealing with, you. imagine all those emotions. Your throat's gone. Uh, um, you got this empty feeling in you. You just found out that you adopted. You want to commit suicide. And then, you know, once I went and got cleaned up and everything, it was like, okay, the last chapter piece to this is go find out what your, your life didn't start in Hollis. Yeah. So I had to get cur And that, that was the thing that kind of made me go get sober too. I said, if by chance I get enough courage to go find my birth mother, I need to be of right, you know, sound body sound. and mind. So after Sarah, after rehab, after therapy, it was go find the lady that put you in this position. And when I found my birth mother, it was just this one question. She said, I know you're dying to ask me why I gave you up. I was like, shit, lady, that's an understatement. <laughs> and then she said, I gave you up to give you a chance. Mm. And then I just sat back and said, Hollis, Christmas time at Hollis, Queens, my dad. Like, imagine if yeah. she didn't. Look, did you joke? And when I speak, now I go on Capitol Hill um, fighting for adoption. I'm yeah. fighting for the foster right. kids and the orphans and stuff like that. You have the like Felix that. organization? Yeah, yeah. So I'm there and I, I, I tell the, you know, the, the people who make all of these laws and shit, I said, y'all make all of these laws and stuff like that, but y'all don't sit down and talk to the people who are living in the madness. You make all of these laws to give them this and get... I said, we don't want handouts. We want opportunities. You know what I'm saying? And my whole thing is every child regardless of their situation, deserves the opportunity to become the people they were put here to be. Look at That's me. That's right. 
My, my birth that's mother right. could have aborted me. And that's a whole other thing. I said, what yeah, if I mean, my birth these... mother didn't decide to give birth to me to give yeah, me up? Yeah, This that's... is all social justice. This is all systemic oppression. It's like the, the reason why you're able to have forgiveness for the people who murdered Jam Master J is the same reason why you're able to have some understanding for what your mother w must have been going through. Exactly, right, exactly. Because you understand it's bigger than them. Exactly. Yeah, it's and all social justice. And yes. Now, I'm not as prolific. And like, I'm not, a, well, I didn't think this. I didn't think I was in the spectrum with you. I didn't think I was you in are. the you spectrum built me. with you and my DNA. One and Chuck D and stuff. But now I'm realizing that I am. Yeah. Like, yeah, we got to get in these courtrooms together. We yeah. got to get on these marches together. We got to let the content that we put out right now, especially because we're in a position that we dominate shit. That's right. We dominate shit. That's so right. So it's time to start having an attitude of total domination. <laughs> and shout out to Public Enemy. Shout out to Chuck D, who was also on the show. And on the show, he made an announcement because it was all that time when people were saying him and Flavor was beefing. So right. on the show, he made an announcement like, look, they can say what they want to say, but we got a new Public Enemy album coming out in like a month or so. And then at a couple of months later... I heard the song with the Beastie Boys and Run DMC and Public Enemy and Flavor was on it, remaking Public Enemy number yeah, one. Number one. And it's full, full circle because you rhyme about your substance abuse oh, yeah, yeah. and about the depression and everything. Right. And I encourage everybody who's watching People's Party to go check out that Public Enemy song, the Public Enemy number one, new version with Run DMC and the Beastie Boys on it. It's, it's banging. It's banging. It's a great album, too. It is. It's and you said that you didn't put yourself in the category of me, but I got to tell you, one of my first records on Raucous, and Jared Meyer is the, one of the founders of Raucous. He's the guy who also is one of the founders of Uprocks, where Uprocks oh, is where People's nice. Party lives, right? So we have a yes. longstanding relationship. Wow. Before the Reflection Eternal record came out, there was a ref, there was a Reflection Eternal single called The Express, Mia High Tech. Oh. And you referenced... The hook of Express was can't stop, don't stop, rock it to the rhythm because I get down oh, and I get yes. down and yeah, I no, sha no, no, no. na na. And you referenced that early. But the, I started the second verse of that first Rorka single by saying, Quali, that's me, the king, the MC. Rhyme, get mine on uh, the uh, no, Can another MC ever fuck with me? Hell no. Uh, and uh, so you are absolutely like tangibly in my DNA. As an artist, Express, I gotta go listen to. Yeah, I love Express. reading your book. You're reading your book was like, okay, stop <laughs> reading, go listen to the song. It was yeah. the best. It was a, it was a um, experience for me. Thank so you. Now you tell me that you do. I, I'm yeah. going to listen to the Express. Really, you did that? Wow. Yeah. The Express. I, I don't know if it's on, it should be on Spotify, but if you can't find it on Spotify, it's on YouTube. Or I'll whatever. find it. Yeah. Um, wow. Really? That's this awesome. has been an, uh, a huge, huge honor. Yes. And a huge privilege for us to have the great, the legendary, the devastating Mike Controller, <laughs> the superhero, Daryl Mack, DMC. We love you, brother. Thank, Thank you, you for gracing the people's party. Thank you for having me, man. It's like a huge honor. Man, that was huge brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.